Sorry. Sorry, Matt. <coughs> Join us, please. Walt. I think you know everybody at the table. Oh, yeah. I do. This is Gordon, and this is one of my law students. Oh, great. Oh, so yeah, bring I'm a different law student every day. I've got four of them this year. Oh, so. <laughs> Lucky you. I'm Lucky you. Or Gordon. Mm -hmm. She's one of your senators, Windsor County, and it's in her right. Seven Windows. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Southern Vermonters. <laughs> Only Southern Vermonters here right now. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Matt, please. Usually doesn't Thank you, Senator Sears. <laughs> Committee. It's great to see you again. For the record, Matt Simon. I live in Manchester, New Hampshire. I work for the Marijuana Policy Project. And I support uh, this bill to legalize, well, it's already legal, but to regulate and tax the production and sales of cannabis for adult use. I think a, a lot has happened in the last couple of years since I spent so much time with you in 2016. Uh, we have two more years worth of data from the states that have pioneered these policies, two more years for our opponents' fears to materialize if in fact they were going to do so. And uh, I would argue that that data is overall very reassuring that uh, supports what we've been saying all along. The prohibition doesn't work, that it produces terrible negative consequences, and that we can produce better results through a regulated market. So as evidence for that being the case, I would suggest that the fact that every state legislature in this region is now seriously considering this. It's kind of proof that Vermont has been right all for the last couple of years to be moving in this direction. Uh, Maine and Massachusetts. Right. Yes. 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 yes, correct. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Our, our colleagues in the House have been lacking courage. I had noticed. Um, <laughs> So yes, I would say that voters in Massachusetts and Maine got it right in uh, November of 2016. Uh, that progress in Maine has been thwarted uh, by the executive branch. Governor Paula Page was not willing to implement that, the regulated aspects of that law. So in Maine, it's been legal to grow and possess, but not uh, a regulated market. Maine does have a new governor, so uh, hopefully by this time next year, there will be a, a robust retail market <coughs> happening in Maine as it's already beginning to happen in Massachusetts. I expect you saw that the first two months of sales were very successful. There are mm -hmm. still fewer than 10 stores open, but they've done well, We actually heard yesterday from a guy from uh, Great Barrington who's on the select board there um, about the experience there and the, and the opening the, um, I think it was the first one in the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So certainly the location of Massachusetts adjoining all of these neighboring states has helped provide a catalyst for neighboring states. So I thought I'd just give you a very brief overview of what, what is happening. Yeah. Uh, Connecticut's new governor, Ned Lamont, has pledged to support legalization and regulation in this year's legislative session. He said that would be one of his top uh, legislative priorities. And the leaders of both the Senate and the House in Connecticut uh, have said that they agree that should be a priority. So it appears. It's just an aside. Ned Lamont used to live and work in Ludlow for the Black River Tribune. <laughs> really? Yeah, yes. I know that. No idea. That was Governor of Connecticut. Malloy actually opposed legalization. He did for many years. So he was an opponent. That's right. So can I just say something? So at some point, can you address the issue that we kept hearing about uh, a couple years ago with regard to um, the states, the, the feds being really um, aggressive about the states that had it with Colorado allowing people to buy from it and letting it flow over to the next state that didn't have anything? I'd be happy so to comment on that. that. I could say that for well, I'll make a note. Save that for save later. later. Yeah. Okay. And if I forget, please remind me. But, uh, yeah. We were at Massachusetts, I think. So. Or yeah. New York. Anywhere you, you want to go. Just finish Connecticut. Yeah. On the I think Massachusetts and Maine have been covered. <coughs> Connecticut is looking very likely to do it this legislative session. I'll go to Rhode Island next. The governor there has, has been not enthusiastic, but now that stores open in Massachusetts, she came out a couple of weeks ago and said, well, now it's happening all around us. We should do it here in Rhode Island. So she's actually including in her budget proposal uh, yeah. She has the yeah. same exact same position on the roadside safety as Governor Scott, I believe. Mm -hmm. I've heard comments 
along those, those lines as well. So Rhode Island appears likely to happen this year. Um, New York, I'm less involved in New York, but uh, certainly aware of the big turnaround there. Governor Cuomo was strongly opposed until uh, a few months ago, and the New York Health Department published a detailed uh, report outlining many of the reasons for a regulated system. So, the notion is still criminal in New York. I'm sorry? I'm correct that possession is still criminal in New York. So it is with an asterisk. Uh, New York is one of many states that passed a form of decriminalization back in the 70s. It's a very, uh, there are a lot of loopholes in that law. For example, if the marijuana is publicly displayed, it becomes a criminal offense. And that's why stop and frisk was so controversial in New York. If somebody gets stopped and frisk, the second the cannabis comes out of their pocket, it becomes a criminal offense. Uh, so it is decriminalized. Well, but it, actually, there was a discussion of people in Great Barrington, which is right on the New York border, coming over from New York, buying the marijuana there, putting it on their front seat, mm -hmm. driving it back to New York. Obviously not smoking it, but if it's public, they can be stopped and charged with a crime. I believe that's right. So it looks like New York is moving in that direction. New Jersey, a lot of people thought that bill would be done by now. There have been, uh, between the legislature and the governor, some back and forth on the details. But uh, the, oh, there's overall support in New Jersey for, for doing this, and everybody seems to expect it will happen within the next few months. Um, I think I've left New Hampshire, my home state, for, for last. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we're lagging behind a little bit in, in the so-called live free or die state. They keep lagging. But. <laughs> yes. Well, I prefer that they didn't. But uh, we know. on the Connecticut border would prefer they did. Well, I'm pleased that we at least finally decriminalized possession so the Vermonters <laughs> passing through our state no longer have to risk arrest for But your point is well, simple possession. everywhere around us is already right. in the process or is already. Yes. Uh, and I believe the New Hampshire House and Senate will pass a bill this session and that our governor will veto it and that it will come down to whether or not we have two thirds in both chambers. I'm not going to prognosticate on that, but certainly the mood is on everywhere. Everywhere policymakers are asking all of the same sorts of questions, trying to make sense of this on a detailed level, trying to understand what's happened in the states that have gone first, how to make good policy around this going forward. And I really think the folks in this building are in a much better position than their counterparts in other buildings, simply because you've spent years on this already and you've already worked through so many of these problems. So that's the big picture. I'd be happy to comment on any Aspect. Senator Nitko would like to comment on the, on the <coughs> federal response now. Right. So, if any change. The federal change. response. So, as I, I believe we all have heard previously, that during the Obama administration, the Justice Department mm -hmm. issued a memo called the Cole Memo that provide, provided guidelines for federal prosecutors. They outlined what their priorities were. Okay. One of them is the one you mentioned of not having out of state diversion. Um, so states did their best to comply with that. That memo was rescinded by Attorney General Sessions, and a lot of people feared that in the wake of that memo being uh, rescinded, there would be a, cra a widespread crackdown. In reality, what it did was it simply left these decisions to the U.S. attorneys. There's never been any question that this activity is illicit under federal law, but the U.S. attorneys have determined that it's not the best use of their limited resources. They typically only get involved in marijuana cases when it's large, large-scale trafficking and, and uh, when it's an effort by a state to regulate that, that commerce. No, no U.S. attorney has yet deemed state businesses that are operating in clear compliance with state law. <coughs> They've never been a priority during the time the Cole Memo was in effect, and they haven't been a priority since. So I can tell you on that front as well that just a couple, I think just last week, uh, the new Attorney General nominee, Mr. Barr, was asked about this in, in his uh, confirmation clear hearings. I know I have it right in front of me. Here it is. Yeah. 
So he actually put his uh, responses in writing to Congress, and he said, that discussed at my hearing, I do not intend to go after parties who have complied with state law in reliance on the Cole Memorandum. Uh, so ultimately, I think there's a real chance that Congress is going to take some actions this year to clarify federal law and hopefully clarify that states are, in fact, free to make their own choices in this <coughs> regard. But absent that, we have many states moving forward and have not been interfered with in any, uh, as long as they're complying with state laws by the Department of Justice. Um, one thing we heard yesterday uh, from uh, a guy who's the select, a select board, I think he's the vice chair of the <coughs> Great Barrington Select Board, was uh, parking was a problem. Yeah. Because of the crowds. Right. And uh, the other problem was evidently in Massachusetts, and I, this is uh, Senator White was unable to be with us yesterday. One of the problems that he felt could be a problem, I'm not sure where he stood on it, but evidently in Massachusetts, if you want to set up a license, you're being asked to make huge donations to local charities. For example, in Northampton, um, there was a request for $10,000 to a donation from the licensee if they wanted to set up business there. And besides other money that goes to the municipality through a sales tax and uh, some of the gross, I think 15% of the gross revenue, I found that to be quite uh, interesting that that would happen in a state like Massachusetts. It's been long known for its honesty and, well, what, <laughs> and, what, what and they, handing out licenses for alcohol. Uh, just, have you run into that in any other states? Well, first of all, the parking issue. I, I think the parking <coughs> issue is somewhat unique to Massachusetts being the first mover in the region. There were people from all over. I drove by the store in Northampton the first day it was open. I stood in line for about 15 minutes and chatted with people. It would have been three hours for me to get in the door, but there was a guy there from Kentucky who drove to be part of history. There was a guy, I mean, just in the media, 10 people in front of me in line. There were people from five different states. So. People came from all over to experience the, the novelty of buying retail cannabis and being part of history. I think we've seen the lines and the wait times diminish as we're now to, I think, eight stores being open. And uh, by the time a retail business opens in Vermont, there, there will be more in Massachusetts. So I, I don't think that's going to be a huge issue for the states that follow Massachusetts regionally. Although, if a business is expecting large volume and it's a tiny town, that's a local, that's a local law enforcement and zoning issue uh, to be dealt with as it arises. The issue of host community agreements in Massachusetts yes. has been pretty unique to Massachusetts in my <coughs> understanding. Um, the idea of the host community agreements is to uh, the municipalities get some buy-in on the businesses and are uh, able to, um, but what happened in the Massachusetts legislation is supposed to be clearly capped at what those agreements are allowed to uh, entail. Well, is there a language that you could either get to Senator White or Michelle to prevent that from happening in Vermont? Um, yeah, I believe so. Um, I, it, it's my understanding. I don't believe the current legislation would authorize host community agreements no. at all, so you wouldn't have that issue. So there are multiple ways that municipalities can be incentivized, and this is the way that Massachusetts chose to do it, both with the local option tax and with these host community agreements. But in reality, uh, because the caps weren't enforced, towns were free to, to uh, negotiate whatever agreements I guess they could. Have. 50, or something. Yeah. I, I heard a number larger than that. I don't know if it's true, but if nobody was enforced, part of it was a problem of the commission said, well, we don't have the authority to enforce this. And the legislature said, yeah, you do. We gave you that authority. So there was a big question. Yeah. You know, they're clearly violating the law. Well, those seem to be the two <laughs> issues, and you would not have expected those to be the two issues. Uh, Given the conversations that we've had, particularly with House colleagues and the governor's office, well, I'm not surprised by the parking and the long wait times at a small number of retail stores in Massachusetts. Uh, I was surprised by the, the trouble with the host community agreements, and it's been very frustrating. So if you are going to include anything like that, uh, well, which I, I don't think you have. I think going to be doing 
in Gov Ops, we're, on Tuesday we're going to take testimony on uh, three things, the board, the uh, public records, how it's in, impact public records and the municipalities. But, right. But so, I think that, but I think yeah. that either your yeah. committee or the finance committee or could end up in somewhere in that area and we want to make sure they don't, that's all. Right. We will, right, so mm -hmm. the state, the, the referendum yeah. that passed a mass required the, the host agreement. Host in order to get a state license, but they had to have they had to have a host agreement with the local municipality, right. which you guys don't have anything like problem with referendum. Well, but if we get into the revenue sharing idea, um, that Massachusetts has, that mm -hmm. can put us there too. Yeah. Well, Anyhow, I, mean, I, I would merely say that if you are going question. to go the route of allowing host community agreements, that they be very clearly defined and be very clearly enforceable, that those contracts can exceed certain limits. A number of, a number of witnesses have, have spoken to the issues of social justice. Have you got any information on what's going on in our other states regarding that issue in, in the marijuana bills? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Uh, you know, the history of the war on drugs and enforcement thereof is very well documented to have had disproportionate impacts uh, on certain communities. So some states, such as Massachusetts and their legislation, have chosen to include social equity provisions, attempting to uh, somewhat redress those damages and make sure that individuals and communities that are harmed do have advantages in the licensing process and, and some help to that they're able to be part of this of this business. So Massachusetts has some language regarding that? Massachusetts does, and this has been a, a point of emphasis, and it's actually those host community agreements that have been the major thing that have under undermined this. Uh, of the first 99 applicants that have, licenses that have been approved, none of them, I believe, are, are minority-owned businesses, and in part that's because the, the towns and cities are saying, give us $100,000 and we'll approve your you know, you will approve your license so you can take it to the state. And uh, equity applicants tend not to have access to that kind of capital, much as small Vermont farmers aren't going to have access to that but kind of capital. Is there any language in the Massachusetts law that addresses that? Uh, there absolutely is, and uh, some other states uh, have included things along those lines. Um, happy to present the ideas. Well, actually, that, what's helpful to me rather than us reinventing the wheel. Right. Um, given the testimony from Lori yesterday and I think some others are, will continue to hear that testimony. Mm -hmm. um, examples of how other states have dealt with social justice issues rather than us right. trying to fumble along and try to get it right. There is one group that, particularly in Vermont, that I believe has been discriminated, discriminated against, you know, until at least you know, maybe even today, but um, I can remember dealing with it um, with Senator Snelling several years ago who <coughs> recognized the Abenaki tribes. So if there's one group in Vermont that has been discriminated against, it's certainly the Abenakis. We passed legislation, I can't remember the year, which Senator Snelling and I introduced to recognize the Abenaki. Uh, and they have been certainly, there's one group, you know, that I could identify. Clearly, obviously, there's other minorities, uh, but that one is one that I would hope we could not forget. We support any reasonable effort to help create an equitable industry, and we're more than happy to be part of that conversation. Other questions from that? Matt, thanks for making the trek over from Thank Manchester, you. and glad to hear my pleasure. The Always good going to see you. Slow and <laughs> hopefully they're very deliberate on this. <laughs> do you have? Does the county have referendums? We do not. The citizen referendums. Oh, but no. like you're smart too. Well, Massachusetts and Maine are the only okay. state that can states in the Northeast that can do this by ballot. Okay. But rest of them all have to go through legislation. It's been interesting to follow the comments in Rhode Island though from the governor. They're, they almost mirror what our governor and mm -hmm. Tom Anderson spoke to yesterday. Uh, uh, the next witness is by phone. It's Mark Hughes from uh, Justice for All.
Mark, uh, it's Dick Sears, joined by the Senate Judiciary Committee and a number of other uh, interested parties and witnesses. Um, and um, hopefully you're feeling better and sorry you couldn't be with us in person, but I recognize that. And so we're happy to have your comments by phone. Thank you very much for having me. Go ahead, if you'd like to start your comments. Uh, I think you know everybody on the committee. Senator Baruth's here, Senator White, Senator Nicker, and Senator Benning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. I, will, um, I will start. I, I think that uh, first I just want to thank you again. Uh, for the record, Mark Hughes. Um, my name is Mark Hughes. Uh, I am the uh, executive director of Justice for All. And we are also the anchor organization of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, uh, the organization previously known as the Racial Justice Reform Coalition. Again, thank you uh, for having me uh, in testimony today. This is a very difficult one uh, because I am faced with a um, a challenge of having a conversation of, about um, political and economic power uh, and white privilege uh, to about 430 years of whiteness. And um, for that reason, uh, it's, it's difficult. It's also difficult because the, the power lies uh, where you sit. And I find myself again coming back to you asking uh, for your help to, um, to advance something uh, for folks uh, that, that don't look like you. And, 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 and I think what that means is it also means that there's, there's already a blind spot that I understand exists uh, in full disclosure. I've listened, I've listened to the testimony from yesterday um, with uh, Attorney Sue. And I, I, I've got some, I've got some feedback there. Um, the positive piece of it is, is that I, we've been here before, and, and we, we were effective. Um, so please, with the, the disadvantage that I have is that I'm not able to see you. Um, but if, if there's if at any given time, if there's anything that I'm saying that you just need to interrupt with, just please just talk over me, and I'll hear you. And, and we can just transition because I think most people with the exception of uh, Senator Beirut understand that I can do the vote. Couldn't understand that. He said that most people of us understand, except for maybe Senator Beirut, who hasn't had as many dealings with him, that he can be repulsed. Well, Mark, uh, you and I have been together in Burlington. Um, I wouldn't say that means I know you can be verbose, but we are we are familiar with each other. <laughs> and welcome to our, our Senate Judiciary Senate. Uh, welcome to Senate Judiciary. I'm so proud to, uh, to have you represent us. I am I am your constituent. I live in Ward 1, and I have been here since 1991. So um, welcome, and, and thank you for representing us up there. Thank you. <clears throat> um, also, I'd like to just to mention that I have um, had the opportunity to review some of your work and, and, and take a look at some of the things uh, that you're doing, um, notably uh, the dream of white, the white village. So I, I wanted to uh, start the conversation uh, with um, just kind of giving you a, 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 an overview of where I want to take you over the next maybe 20 or 30 minutes, if, if I would uh, be allowed, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to do it at about 15 to 20. I've got about 10 other witnesses this morning, Mark. If you could. Are you with, sir? I don't have, tw I don't have 40 minutes. I don't either. I, I have about 20 or 30, but I can make it 20 if that's what you need. Let's make it 20. Let's make it a, a 20, please. Get right to it, please. I'm happy to hear it. Yeah. So what we've got is, is um, I'm taking a look at the background of a really public with this, um, this entire um, endeavor. And it, it looks like, you know, after the statewide tour, there were three reports that came in. 
a total of 70 recommendations. There was there were no recommendations that had any uh, reference to uh, racial equity or diversity on the 70 recommendations, that 70 recommendations. Those recommendations range from prevention and education, roadway safety, and training and regulation. I do understand uh, that um, this, this train is already on the track and it's headed down the road, but I just wanted to just take a brief pause and, and just uh, lay out a couple of things and try to connect them um, some thoughts surrounding what it is that we're really trying to address. Uh, one would think that what we're talking about here is the war on drugs. And I think that though that is partially true, I, I just what I want what I'd like to do is, is I'd like to connect the war on drugs uh, to um, to the challenges that, that we've had politically uh, with um, with some of the strategy. Um, I'd like to connect the war on drugs to the civil rights uh, movement uh, as well. Uh, you know, going back to the Nixon years, uh, 50 years ago, I'd like to connect that uh, to the challenges that we uh, that is continuous to the uh, the, uh, the Jim Crow South, which is continuous to uh, lynching in in the South, uh, as well as uh, uh, segregation. Uh, the uh, convict leasing as well as uh, connecting these uh, challenges uh, to uh, uh, sharecropping and then also slavery. And I'll just pause there for a moment and just say that what we're talking about, we're, talking, we're, not, we're not really talking about those of us, those who have dug into maybe 70 or maybe it's like there's nearly 100 folks who signed this petition uh, requesting your attention on this matter, and as well as this alliance. The, the, the thought process that we come into this discussion with is not a very narrow focus just on looking at you know, what this language means in this particular document, specifically as it pertains to a very narrow um, group of individuals, uh, uh, say, uh, those who are say or, or, or we can you know empirically identify as being affected. But what we're talking about is a nation, okay, because we you know obviously we were not we are a part of a, a, a the fabric of a, a larger societal challenge. Um, so that's where I want to start the conversation is, is just to say this is a very broad discussion. This is this is not about marijuana or regulation and taxation only in the state of Vermont. This is, this is about a, a history, a, a national history of white supremacy, okay? And I think that um, to, to, to view this otherwise, I think this is uh, severely missing uh, the, the sentiment of me and also the intention here. Uh, I just briefly, if, if I could uh, be humored, just to read one thing here from the report uh, on Act 54, um, Senator, uh, uh, let's see, excuse me for, I'm just trying to some notes here, but yeah, so the, the report, I would imagine that uh, Senator Benning, when you were a member of the HRC, you probably would imagine writing something like this, but Karen Richards did. It says, the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s saw enormous progress on issues related to race. Additional laws were enacted to protect the rights of people of color, including uh, Title VII uh, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited employment discrimination based on color, race, color, national origin, and religion, excuse me, religion, Four years later, housing discrimination based on these categories was outlawed by the Fair Housing Act of 1968. While these laws, in theory, provide remedies for intentional discrimination or discrimination that has an adverse impact on, on, on particular protected classes, they do not change the underlying racial oppression. This is because white people continue to control virtually every power structure in the country, including federal, state, and local government, and their agencies, corporations, businesses, schools, and etc. Uh, when coupled with racial bias, whether it is explicit or implicit, this power of the majority results in the oppression of those in the minority. We live in a white supremacy culture. 
add this to white privilege and white fragility, and we begin to see how difficult it is to escape the current cycle despite a belief in that in, in equality in access and opportunity. So the, the, again, this report released the 17th of December 2017 by Assistant Attorney General David Schur uh, and HRC Executive Director Karen Richards is reflective of a statewide tour in information that they will be able to pull in uh, from three stops across the state. And <clears throat> consistent with that, and thank you for the work, S5 in the special session last year, the legislative intent of S5 is, I quote, uh, it is the intent of the General Assembly to promote racial justice through, throughout the state by mitigating systemic racism in all systems of state government and creating a culture of inclusiveness. So where I'm <clears throat> going with this is probably clearly obvious is that we, we have a very- Actually, I'm not that bright, Mark, so it's not clearly obvious to me how it relates, what would you like to see in S54 that would help you um, to deal with the social justice issues? And I think you have posted several times on Facebook where we are friends, Mark, um, <laughs> things about reparations, and i really like you to get to that so we can connect S54 to what you would like to see. I think we are in agreement that there needs to be um, some things about social justice in there to make clear how we're going to deal with it, but I would love to have your thoughts about S54. I understand your concerns about racism, systematic racism, implicit bias, explicit bias, etc. But I'm really not that bright. I'm sorry, what was the last thing you said to me? I'm not that bright. Oh, I don't on. understand. <laughs> I really need, that, Mark, my friend, that, I need to understand what you would like to see in S54. I see. Yeah, how it relates to S54. Uh, I, absolutely. So, in moving, moving on to the, um, the notes that I have on S54, one of the things that I, I think is really important is obviously the if you go down, to, I'm going to start over in section. Um, uh, I don't have this built in front of me, but I'm, I, do, I do have some notes. I think that there is a, a section 903, um, the priority surrounding, um, uh, let's see, disproportionately, functional disproportionately impact, impacted rather. I, I think that there are. Page 27. Page 27. Right. And, and I think that one of the views that is being expressed here is, is that um, there is a, a concern about offering um, a level playing field for folks who could be impacted. And I think that question is about who is impacted. <coughs> what I'd like to see, what I'd like to recommend there is, is that if, if there is an error that it would be, that it would be, um, that you would err towards making the mistake of overcompensating. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is that um, this, there, there, I think that there should be a, a conscious effort to extend, if not overextend, to make sure that uh, folks who are impacted, what does folks who are impacted mean? I know there's a lot of conversation about, I don't know, the state or so, folks that are here in the state. Um, but I think the reason why I, I laid out what I laid out at the onset of this conversation is, is that there are disparities across all systems and they exist always in the result of any, any history, not just drugs. Um, there are families that are impacted. There are friends that are impacted. There are, there are, there are many folks, and we know with the uptick of folks coming into this state from out of state, there's going to be a whole other level of, of challenges to deal with. I think this is a this is not just a black and brown issue this is also a poor issue so this, I, so I would recommend that this session would be addressing um, not so much surgically those folks who uh, say for example are impacted um, say for example by a a, a, a criminal record uh, but 
I would suggest, suggest that this session would be reflecting on folks who, are, who come from a, a, um, an, 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 an ethnic background that would even fall within this category and folks who come from an economic background who could potentially fall in this category. So we're not just looking at black and brown people, we're also looking at poor people. Mm -hmm. it, I agree. I agree. We can we can uh, improve on this language. I mean, I think the concern here is, is that you know, and I think to to, to uh, Senator Ben Ruth's point made yesterday is, is you know, what if this person you know comes from a background that is privileged and, and they're trying to take advantage of this system? And I understand that as being a concern. Um, and, but I think that largely. Um, no pun intended. I think that category would be minority. I, I really don't. I really don't believe it. I think that when we're considering this legislation, you know, if, if we take and, and, and make a stretch and, and use the presumption of something that is that is highly unlikely, I mean, I think we're being counterproductive. Kind of because most poor, most black people are poor, and most poor people are white. Yeah. So, in terms of licensing, uh, in section, I believe it's 901, um, there's some, I think there's some discussion on um, the size of the business and so forth, and, and I'd, I'd like to see some language in there about prioritizing a privilege and category in terms of who's in and wanting to get these licenses. I don't, I don't know that there will be, to the right, I don't know if there's going to be a, a number of um, if there's going to be a limitation on the number of licenses, if there's going to be a, a staggering of the introduction of when these licenses are going to be available, but I'd like I'd like to see black and brown and poor people standing at the front of that line. I I think we all would. And and Native Americans. And local farmers. Black black and black and uh, okay, colored people. What was their last comment? Was, I said, I said Native Americans. And I said local farmers. And as I look through my notes, I think that the, um, the I, I think those are some of the major points in terms of, of yep. how we, how we could, um, how we could, um, address this. I know there's a, a huge challenge, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I learned a, a huge challenge in saying, okay, well, this is a tax to regulate bill. What the heck are we doing here? Uh, we don't want to get much down. We got to get this thing moving and can't just put everything in the bill. I understand that. I think it's unfortunate that, that we did a statewide tour. We came back for three reports, and there's not one word in any of those three reports about equity or, or uh, diversity uh, in light of the fact of this history, this dissertation that I opened with. But I think we can fix that, and I think we, we can address uh, this, some of this, at least in this. My concern is, is that, and I know we can't go back and, and fix history, is we, we've done this before. We've done this before. We've done, we've done this just recently where we, we've taken off and we've done something, and, and, and the folks that were impacted by it were still impacted, okay? And I think that's, that's a huge concern. You know, it's, it's not to call out the shame or anything like that, but we, we've got to face that. We, we've got to understand that it's just not right for us to make laws um, that, that uh, advantage uh, folks and, and enable them to be privileged when, when there are other folks who are harmed critically, you know, uh, by, by the, the exact instrument that we're legalizing. So we, I think it's just so important that we just be mindful of that, and I, and I know that those who are sitting on this committee are, are, are painfully aware of that, and I understand the challenge that you have, and I just wanted to chime in as a person of color, a, per, a person who comes from a place of no privilege, uh, and also a person who's doing the work in community uh, throughout the state, is, is it to urgently remind you. Now, I do know that there are things that you can do that are outside of this uh, particular piece of legislation. And I know historically, although I haven't been around long, um, I know that historically, that there have been situations where certain bills, and even this session, certain, certain initiatives are moving forward, and because of the wisdom and the knowledge that you have as our representatives, as our senators, you put the kibosh on one thing so something else can move, or else what we do is you're, you at least balance it out and say, well, wait a minute, chronologically, what do we want to do first? It may be separate bills. So, so I know that there is a, I believe it's, is it F-17, uh, Mr. Chair, 
who was going to take up what, and the House would like to take the lead on the expungement bills. Sure. We have our own views. We believe that most crimes that don't involve um, serious violence should be expungable. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, you know, I don't know what the House will do, but they're going to take the lead on that. Um, I totally agree that most now, we did have fact, I don't know if you heard the testimony yesterday about the number of people who are uh, under the Corrections Department for purely for marijuana possession charges, that there are eight of them, five of them, uh, people who possessed amounts above two ounces, three of them who possessed between one ounce and two ounces. So it's a very small number, all are in probation, nobody's incarcerated, which is good news. Um, but on the other hand, um, I understand what you're saying. I'm just, again, you meant, when you said reparations, you meant expungement? Is that? I did. I'm going to talk about reparations later in the conversation. Yeah, well, I've got about nine more minutes, so I need to, I've got, I got four other witnesses, five other witnesses waiting here. I think we can be done in less than nine minutes. That's okay, Mr. Chair. please. Yep. So we also I mean, got copies of the uh, Massachusetts rules, which we can in, uh, in, inflict in here into the uh, not inflict, but add to S fifty four. You don't want to inflict them. No. <laughs> Go ahead with the reparations, please. <laughs> I, I will just. I would just say that, you know, to, to the comments that you made earlier, I did in fact hear the the, um, the numbers and the statistics that you opened with yesterday uh, with, 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 the, uh, with the testimony of, 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 of Lois Truman. And it, those numbers, those eight numbers, I think it's part of the reason why, Mr. Chairman, that I opened the discussion in the way that I did. Because uh, first of all, those numbers were they reflected in the uh, this is with, with due respect, it's talking a little bit lightly here, but I, but I try to say this, is, is that those numbers just reflect uh, who, you know, who's currently under, uh, under the system right now, okay? We've got, you know, the, the, the war on drugs is a 50-year war, okay? And the history of black and brown people being oppressed in this nation is a 400-year story, okay? And, and there are 49 other states. So I, I, don't think, I don't think it's productive for us to, to, to view this um, once again, as an exceptionalist problem of, of the state of Vermont, because we're not exceptional, and it's probably the national problem, and, it, and it's also a problem that has endured throughout our entire national history. Okay, so that approach, you know, although the intent is um, very much respected, I just don't think it's going to yield us a product that is at the end of the day what you're trying to get to, and that is, I'm sure, it's fair. Okay? Um, so, that being said, I just want to turn the page and just close out with just a couple of thoughts. Uh, just, just, first of all, uh, thanking you for your time, because uh, I really appreciate just having the opportunity to get, get out in front of you and have that conversation. I want to honor um, Senator um, Jeanette White. 
respectfully call her a homegirl because I'm an Iowa native. Um, but uh, I just want to honor what you're doing in, in your committee this afternoon at 2.30 as you, uh, for the first time in 242 years, uh, take up uh, the constitutionalization of slavery as an issue uh, in, in your committee. So I want to thank you and applaud you for what you're doing there. Because uh, that's a big deal. It is totally related to what it is that we're having a conversation about today. <clears throat> also, in addition to that, I, I do want to close and have that conversation. Um, uh, Senator um, Benning, I, I do want to still, um, I, it, it just occurred to me that I had to address you as, as yet, and I, it, I do recall a conversation that we had uh, maybe a year or two ago in the lounge about that very issue, uh, that constitutionalization of slavery. So this is that, uh, and I appreciate your support on that. I've seen, I've seen that you've actually uh, supported that as a, uh, as a, as a proposal. <clears throat> the, the, um, in closing, I would just say that there is uh, a challenge, Senator Bayloo, with ha appointing five folks and causing them to, and expecting them to be uh, the folks who, 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 who actually oversee this whole business, if you will, I think the way we were expected yesterday, of cannabis, while at the same time being expected to play a role as uh, reparations overseers, okay? And you're right, it's not, quote, doable, as you said. And, and I think that um, it, it, should, it should be noted, and I want to go on record as saying, as is that uh, there is a reparations bill in legislative council right now, and it is the same reparations bill, almost exactly the same as the reparations bill that, that our United States a representative from the Michigan, John Conyers, put forward in the United States House of Representatives from 1989 until the time that he left the United States House in 2017. It was never taken up, not once. <clears throat> and it's also not been, it's not been introduced by our Senate here in our state either. And the brief details on it, and I'm almost done here, the brief details on it are just that it was just a point of commission for folks to look at the idea of slavery <clears throat> and to come back with a report in about a year and to provide to, to the assembly <clears throat> recommendations to be on what they think about how we might want to proceed as a state. Now, I, it's unfortunate that I haven't been able to find a senator in the assembly to call that council and say, yes, I would like to sponsor that bill. So I would like to leave that with you, the five of you today, if you could please, if one of you would consider doing so, because I think that that is a component of what it is that we're, we're wrestling with here. And you are right, Senator Ben Ruth. We do not need this, these five folks dealing with reparations all day long. We need to deal with him. Um, and just a warning, and, 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 and you know, just a final note I'll say is that this still has been taken, it, 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 it will be introduced in the House. Uh, because there has been one House member who's agreed to do so. Uh, so, you know, we'll see how far that goes. Again, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for your time. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to come for you today. I don't think it's a small thing. I honor the work that all of you guys are doing. I think I think you guys are amazing. Uh, with the hundreds of years of experience that you guys bring to the table, uh, it's a powerhouse sitting around the table, and I'm looking forward to to see the great things that you're doing in this session. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, committee. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Hope you get well enough to come and join us soon. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you talk Mark. to you later, I'm sure. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the next thank witness you. is, um, sorry, I, I didn't realize you had a question. I didn't. Oh, okay. the next witness is Gray, and I can't pronounce your last name. I'm sorry. sorry. So to thank the committee for having me here today, my name for the record is Graham Yuneng Sprufernacht. I'm a field organizer for rural Vermont which largely means that I work both in the field and in policy, so you'll see me around the State House, but also doing events and grassroots, but also grass tops kind of organizing uh, around issues for rural Vermont. 
So I don't think I've testified in this committee before. I don't think so. So it might be worth just talking to you about who Rural Vermont is and the work we do briefly. I think we pretty much know what Rural Vermont is, but go ahead. Okay. Well, just quickly, for those who may not know, we're a 30-year-old organization started during the dairy crisis in the 1980s, which, as many of you know, has continued forth to today. More or less as a group of community organizers helping to get farmers' voices represented and listened to. And over the years, this organization has transformed and worked in a lot of different ways on a number of different issues, from very local food sovereignty issues, such as on-farm slaughter, the chicken bills, uh, the notorious chicken bills if you live in Waitsfield area. Um, on um, raw milk, but also larger national, international issues like NAFTA, GATT, RBGH, um, uh, the GMO issue and campaign. And you know, this year we have a number of issues we're looking at, both outside the State House but also in the State House. And this is, is certainly one of the issues which we've been tracking and concerns about, and also just some opinions about that we thought we'd share with you. So I guess. You know, an overview of our perspective on this bill and, and our, our approach is looking at equity, access, and you know, comprehensive criminal justice reform, and as Mark was saying, reparations or redress for, for this history of war on drugs and the effect it's had on folks who've gotten embroiled in it. Um, from our perspective, this, body should em this bill should embody a response to the war on drugs, sort of recognizing its history of racism and classism and mass incarceration but it should also be responsive to the consolidation and concentration of the pharmaceutical and agricultural industries and what we've seen in other states uh, in relationship to legalizing marijuana in terms of it becoming essentially a commodity crop. Much like many others, we see one of the crises in dairy right now has to do with oversupply um, and then also issues with water quality. And I think that we can see a lot of these same issues with cannabis if we're not careful uh, in this state as we see in other states. I was able to make it to some um, commission meetings and some um, tax and regulate committee meetings. Also, I've talked with some growers in the field and some folks in the processing and distribution end of industry who would like to get into that. Rural Vermont's also done a lot of work on hemp over the years, and as much as these are two very different issues, I think you're all probably aware of, too, that a lot of the processing and distribution and et cetera, infrastructure is, there's also cross-purpose there, potentially. So, we were, we were relatively happy with parts of the commission report. Um, I haven't spent as much time looking at the bill you have worked with yet, so I'm, I'm largely going to be speaking about what we saw there, and, and I, I look forward to continuing to look at this bill and make time for that. But what was particularly important, we felt, about the commission bill was that they really went through an effort of, of prioritizing um, small growers, distributors, and processors, and offered, uh, suggesting at least for the first year, potentially for the first few years, an unlimited number of small growing licenses. Um, one of the points that we particularly brought to the fore over and over again in rural Vermont is the need for direct market access for small farmers. Small farmers, historically, presently, that is a niche that we enjoy. Um, we cannot compete at a price point or often at a scale of economy that other size growers can. We rely. I just want to make sure yeah. I understand what you mean by direct access. Yeah. Could you further explain direct access? Does that mean? Selling at the local farm, <coughs> end, or does that mean selling to the local um, like a CSA. dispensary? Or like no, a CSA. you mean direct market access, like a CSA, a farm stand, a farmer's market booth, where people can have a direct relationship with their customer. That is, we talk about craft, I think, in this industry, and that word's been thrown out a lot. And sometimes people throw out. That's in the commission report? That is not in the commission report. The commission did, however, based on, I think, our testimony, put in a provision recommending a direct marketing consultant for small growers. And when I asked what that meant and how they were trying to address that with that position, it, I, didn't, I wasn't able to get many answers, so I was really curious to hear if you all had, had looked into that further or understood that. But my main point with that is that this is how small growers are able to maintain viability in a very competitive marketplace. Um, it's also, when you talk about craft, some people have mentioned certain beer companies and stuff, but the reality is this is a product that's grown on a farm and it could be directly sold from a farm. There's no in-betweens that need to happen, whereas with beer and alcohol, one, you're dealing with a much more dangerous product. It is currently allowed to be sold at farm stands and at farmer's markets. Um, and, um, excuse my lapse there for a moment. Um, <clears throat> When we talk, beer products often are, are, are going to have an accumulation of products from all over the country and world. 
this is something, like I said, is just from the farm. When you're talking about a craft product, you're talking about a relationship with a grower, a relationship with a product, that grower being able to talk about it and explain it. Um, they have uh, an identity associated with it. And that's what brings people to their farm. That's what gets them buying other farm products. That's what brings them into small communities to increase the economic viability of those communities. I'm, I'm dumbfounded by this discussion, frankly. And I realize there are people who would like to do this, but mm -hmm. I understand tax, and I understand how you can tax somebody at that, but how do you regulate? How do we regulate to make sure the quality and et cetera if they're selling it at a farm stand? I haven't seen the Department of Health dropping by the local farm stand to check on the lettuce. Actually, um, they do. Do you want to do this? I mean, no, not, they do, but they do. They've I'm closed not, down some people at the Brattleboro Farmer's Market for not. Okay, so the health yeah. department does check the local farm stand. And just to be clear, actually, I think that you'll find that we're actually calling for, um, we're not trying to minimize the amount of regulation. In fact, we think that the model that exists currently with, um, <coughs> with the centralized distributors being the medical marijuana facilities, which have not been regulated in terms of testing, um, that we actually think third-party testing is incredibly important um, for all kinds of toxic herbicides, pesticides, as well as phytochemical constituents, and that anybody should have to submit their product for third-party testing. That should be a prerequisite to sale. Um, so it's not, I'm not suggesting that those folks shouldn't be required to follow similar regulations, but we are suggesting that there's scale-appropriate regulations and that different, the, the realities of the farm economy are sort of acknowledged and that we try to work with this dynamic that exists. Um, um, if, if I could, so you mentioned, I, I did my first two years in the Senate on on ag and worked with raw milk and custom slaughter and um, game birds being exempted from the inspection regime in certain situations. And to my eye, those were all um, incremental moves. Mm -hmm. So it was convincing state government that this was safe. It was con convincing consumers that it was safe. And so we made little moves each year and we eventually got to a place with um, the more direct relationship between the, the producer or the farmer and, and the customer where they could buy without the, so much in the way of state middleman. Um, so that's the way I see this bill. Is it's, a, it's a big first step. It's an indigestible first step for a lot of people. So I think ultimately we we can get to the place you're talking about. Uh, to go along with Senator Sears, I don't see a way to do that from the get-go where we would have farm stands um, selling directly to consumers because part of the, the rationale for this bill from the beginning has been security from seed to sale. Um, so I hope you don't see the efforts of the committee as completely hostile to what you're talking about, but it might be a question of an evolution over time rather than uh, a yes or no um, forever. And I, and I hear that this is a clearly a huge, like you said, indigestible piece of legislation for lots of folks and for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a fair way of looking at it. That it's, gonna, it's clearly going to start somewhere and we're going to try to get to a better place for this over time. Um, <coughs> comparing it to, I think, the, the on-farm slaughter rules, et cetera, I think we're, we're definitely not satisfied with where on-farm slaughter is right now at rural Vermont. Um, and we're well, let's not go this. We don't need to go there. But just yeah. to say that these are things that have been age-old practices that have been <coughs> existing. Well, They're both things that have been yeah. existing in the dark. Let me just, we're bringing let me just so that future witnesses are clear. Mm -hmm. My interest is in passing a tax and regulated bill. I don't mind having things about social justice. I don't mind having things but expungement, farm sales, that sort of stuff. You know, as a future discussion, my goal is to get a tax and regulated bill through the Senate that um, doesn't isn't dragged down by a discussion about roadside safety and public and education. And if I drag it down by having discussion about roadside sales, I get into the roadside safety. I get into the education. How do I keep it away from kids? Blah blah blah. So I'm happy to put something in there that looks to the future to, as Senator Baruth just said, but I really don't want to weigh this bill down with more controversy than is already here. Well, I, hear you. I hope that makes sense, but... Um, no, I hear your concern. I, and I, and well, I it's not a concern, it's a reality. 
If I put in what you've just asked for, the bill will not pass. And if even it passed, it would not, it would get immediately vetoed. And we'd be right back where we started from. Could I ask a question? Well, first of all, I, I agree with the CSA model, not farmers markets necessarily, but the CSA, sure. where you're only selling to a group of people that you've already identified. And that's the way CSAs work. Sure. But I am just curious how you would, you suggested at the beginning of your testimony that in the bill we should address the impact that the war on drugs has had on disparate communities and how to, rec how would you put that, we tend not to do um, findings in bills because what happens is that people disagree with the findings, mm -hmm. not the content of the bill. And then you end up in a fight over the findings, not the content of the bill. So we don't do findings like the House does. So the only place you could put that in would be in findings. So I'm, I'm just curious how you would suggest putting something like that in. You mean like a recognition of the history of well, yeah. the law? Yeah. We're going to consider yeah. next week this, uh, what yeah, Massachusetts did in their, yeah. um, their commission actually set the rules guidance for equity provisions. Yeah. And just some of the start. things that are done in other parts, places in agriculture at least, in terms of trying to address reparations, things are, are specific grants, specific programs and scholarships for historically disadvantaged exactly. communities. What's that? I said that isn't in this bill. We're not talking about how to distribute money or anything. I'm just I'm yeah. just trying to give you yeah. ideas okay. for how some of these considerations yeah. might work. Yeah. But I agree with Mark too that you know I'm I'm not a person of color. I'm not one of these impacted communities. Um, and I think that going to a commission made up of those impacted communities to determine what this looks like might be a, a decent idea to move towards or to at least bring some of those folks in to, det to determine that. I'm more sitting here as a principal and sort of mm -hmm. solidarity with those communities as well. Um, so again, you know, the, the, just prioritizing um, small growers, historically disadvantaged folks, and people who have been impacted by the war on drugs, um, reducing barriers and providing opportunities for the current economy to come into the open. I thought that the report did a good job of acknowledging that this isn't a new economy, this is an existing economy. And the goal is to really bring it into the light and provide those people the opportunity to come into the light. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging that these folks have financed all kinds of businesses, families, farms over the years doing this work. Um, they also carry a lot of the, the skills and understandings. Um, we noticed also that certain people were forbidden from participating in this economy. Um, in the bill, I believe folks with felony histories in the, in the committee recommendations, at least. And this is in the commission recommendations, I'm sorry, maybe not in your bill. But in the commission recommendations, I believe folks with a felony history were prohibited from um, engaging in this, and that was something we had concerns around. Um, I mentioned third party testing, both for, and this gets us a little to the, some of the ecological impacts we have and it, concerns around that. And I think the recommendations in the commission report around scale will go towards addressing some of our immediate concerns with ecological impacts. Even speaking with Kerry Gigware in the past, you know, he said to me that it's really the large grows that are going to be using pesticides and herbicides mm -hmm. a lot. And that's to me an indication that in order to be ecologically sensitive, we might want to prioritize the sm smaller growing operations and really test for these substances which might be used. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying I'm really grateful for that in the commission report and just want to reiterate our, our um, appreciation for that. Um, <coughs> one of the concerns we have is sort of this rural-urban divide and this class divide. If I'm not sure if you're built, but the commission was not providing places to indulge. Um, and without that, you're left with a situation with those who have a certain degree of privilege, they have the space, the ability to do so. But those without are in an urban scenario may not have that. So there's a, there's a question there of, of sort of privilege and access. Well, I agree. Um, we decided as introducing the bill to take out a provision regarding cafes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't know what we'll do with that as the bill works its way through, but you're correct. Or even you're, you're pointing out one group, another group might be tourists who come here to visit the lawn and buy some marijuana and have no legal place to smoke. Right, Payson. So that's the same thing. I mean, Very, yep, yep. It's more of an, another access issue. I guess I think the um, the question of towns' abilities to approve or not approve at a local level is, an, is a very interesting question. You know, we're certainly an organization which supports local governance, but there's also got to be limitations on this. And we see issues already with zoning in Vermont uh, affecting how different pharmacies businesses are or aren't allowed to operate, and ultimately the viability of farms in certain towns or not. And this would certainly 
create an impact on that, and it's something that for the committee to consider, I think, is what would the effects of a town forbidding or outlawing the growing have on farmers in that community versus farmers in other communities. Isn't there a sentence in here or a, a, a section, Michelle, that deals with uh, the inability of a community to zone the a facility out, even though they have an opt-in or opt-out? And if there isn't, there should be. I think we talked about it as an issue. I, it came up uh, yesterday in discussions. Well, I brought it up before. Yep. And, and I think um, we talked about it a little bit in Seneca Box yesterday <coughs> afternoon, and they're going to be working on the municipal part on Tuesday, and we'll look at some, doing some language for that to make uh, sure. Because right. I think they have the ability to do the zoning, but I understand your concern, which is that you don't want them to basically use their inherent municipal authority to essentially ban it without going through the voting process. Right. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To clarify, <clears throat> is your objection mostly or exclusively about um, growing licenses being denied, or, or is it about towns being able to opt out uh, of recreational sales? I think it's about that intersection, you know, and how that affects small business viability. Um, and we see this not for, for the farming community, we don't see this as as a primary crop. You know, like I said, we're not going to be able to compete with a commodity of scales that come from out west. Um, even though that's clearly not legal in Vermont, it's still coming in and we know that. But we're also, if we look at unlimited small growing licenses, for example, and we're not giving larger growing licenses, then this is going to be a sort of a side project of a lot of farms. It's going to be like, hey, we can grow 500 feet square foot of canopy space. Mm -hmm. This will actually make us this much more viable this mm -hmm. year. But if you, and sim similarly, it may be a lot of distribution. I don't know how the laws around distribution and, and um, stores are going to work. So it's harder for me to, comp to, to talk about so that. Maybe it may need to be some sort of cooperative arrangement for the storage and distribution. Sure. In other words, the small farmer, um, a group of small farmers do it together, um, have small plots that they control, and then the group, if they could come to an agreement, would then distribute it or wholesale it to uh, distribute to the to the retailer. Retailer, thank you for that word. I, that would how I would envision that working. Mm -hmm. That it probably wouldn't be economically viable for a five, you know, a small farm to if it's part of their crop to just grow it without joining with several other farmers. And I guess that's part of the concern we have is that farmers tend to get pennies on the dollar for the industries they're a part of, and we want to make sure that that's not the case with this. Well, if they, if they are the cooperative, then they would be controlling. I don't know how it all works. I've never been, never been a farmer, and I've never sold crops, so I have no idea how it will work. I know in the milk field, it's pretty, you know, the, the, it's the large corporation. Well, so there must at, be examples in the... Right, I think the cooperative model in the milk field is not what we want to look towards as an example at this no, point, I but, but I hear you that cooperative structures are what we want to look towards yeah, in terms yeah. of the future. Pretty yeah. soon the farmers will be listening to the futures um, report on marijuana. It's already out. Mm -hmm. They already do a futures yeah, report on? Oh. But part of my point well, is, too, we, want, we don't want yeah, to speak on commodity. Okay. Sure. Just being concerned about this becoming a commodity crop versus a, a, a small crop that exists in Vermont and actually helps farmers and local communities. Um, and just to, I think lastly, just go back, I think when I mentioned direct sales, it wasn't necessarily to say that it needs to happen everywhere at once, but it's more like you're suggesting, Senator, that what are models at which we could create this possibility for people and create those lines of access such that more of a dollar does actually return to the <coughs> grower and there's a relationship there between them and their farm and the consumer. Um, and again, you know, as Mark said, it's not just about the people who are currently facing consequences, it's about this history of consequences and impact that people have experienced around this particular substance and our criminalization of it over time, and how do we redress that? Um, but thank you all very much for your time. Uh, I, I, you know, if you. I'd appreciate being invited back in the future as this goes forward, and I would love to provide more of that farmer voice and input over time so that we can give you some of that because it is those are the folks who are going to be at the heart of this in terms of producing the crop we're talking about. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Press conference. Press conference. Oh, press. No, it's actually. Uh, um.
Kaden. Oh, uh, uh, we'll get to you after the break. Can we get back at 20 minutes after so that we yes. can clean up, uh, get back in track here on the schedule? So, and uh, so we'll take a 20 minute break if that's okay. Okay, for the record, my name is Eli Harrington, and I'm testifying as co founder and COO of Hedy Vermont. Um, I'll start by just giving a little bit of background about our company. We are coming up on three years old, uh, startup to 20 somethings in Vermont uh, who are friends living in Burlington, saw cannabis conversations happening, and thought there was a need for people to get more news and information as well as access uh, to the political process. So um, I am now a registered lobbyist, um, and my charge for Hedy Vermont is to make this process accessible to our partners and members, so that's why I'm here. Um, I think reporting is probably more journalism than advocacy, but we are trying to change legislation. I'd rather be radically transparent. So um, that is, that's kind of really the main agenda that we have as Hedy Vermont is access and information, not a specific uh, target. So I, I want to talk about kind of what our company, we are media, we are events, uh, we are also membership, an organization. So uh, we have now over 500 individual members and over 55 legal Vermont businesses uh, who pay us an annual membership fee. I worked for two and a half years at the Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so I would compare our business kind of as a de facto chamber of commerce. We're just not offering insurance. We're offering um, low cost advertising and promotion and events for really what are mostly startup businesses and small farms uh, at this point, and a lot of them are, are, are CBD and sort of hemp. So um, related to events with putting out information, uh, there was an interest in people connecting. Uh, so our first event was April 2016. We had a panel at the Skinny Pancake. Since then, we have literally done uh, over 100 different events, ranging in size and scale. Uh, we started the first Vermont Hemp Fest, which we are very proud to note on NEK Day. Happens up at Burke Mountain. Um, well, this is the second. Went to the press conference. Just so you know, your clock here is fast. I, we, we know that. We're going by Peggy. So <laughs> we're going to get BGS to fix it once they figure out how to uh, fix the parking. Ours down there is seven minutes slow. So I'm always late. No problem. I, I didn't want to miss it. I know. I know. We had, um, OK, so go ahead. I'm sorry. We interrupted oh, no, no problem. with our time piece. Um, so I just I wanted to know with the you know with the events because I'm going to talk about what our company does and that's really media and events and then I want to answer questions and maybe talk about what's happening in other states and some lessons to learn um, and a little bit of feedback on this but uh, I mentioned sort of some of the range of events that we do the Vermont Hemp Fest we are confirmed this will be our third year in September first year we had over 500 attendees and over 30 businesses last year we had over 800 attendees and over 50 businesses, both times sold out the Burke Mountain Hotel. Um, and very proud to bring that event to a place where rural economic development needs to happen. So um, beyond that, we also put on the Vermont Cannabis and Hemp Convention. Last year it was at the Sheridan. We had over 1,500 people show for the weekend. This year we're doing it at the fairgrounds um, because the interest is exploding and that is really a straight trade show. Um, and convention and business convention uh, ranging to our other sort of larger signature event which we recently had was the Hedies which is the first Vermont Cannabis Growers Cup um, now I emphasize all these events are legal events and we spend a lot of time and energy making sure that we are both staying within the letter and the spirit of the law uh, with how we execute these events uh, most notably I think on July 1st and I want to point to this experience we hosted the legalization celebration in Johnson. Uh, this was meant to be an event that acknowledged the social and legal change that had happened, and for the first time, uh, acknowledged that people would be able to consume legally. We did not provide cannabis for people there. It was not sold on site. Um, but that idea of having an event where consumption of what was then a, became a legal substance um, was, kind of, was kind of groundbreaking and led to some, some difficulties. Um, our first venue was the uh, Lang Farms, the Barnes at Lang Farms. Very popular wedding venue. There's a golf course attached. 
Um, and the owners were very happy. It became clear in our conversation with the town of Essex, because for us, if the neighbors don't want you there, it doesn't matter what the police think, right? This is always, when we're going in and planning an event, um, kind of the orthodoxy and as Vermonters, how you have to operate. So it became very clear that the town of Essex, um, mostly through their attorney's liberal definition of the word public place, which is something that we can certainly clarify with this legislation, um, that we were not going to be welcome. They were going to ask for a special permit to have amplified music and worried about the smell on Route 15 and uh, Department of Transportation permits to have cars going in and out of a state highway. Um, so we quickly learned that they didn't want us there, we didn't want to fight that fight, and moved our event to Johnson, uh, a farm, Willow Crossing Farm, uh, actually owned by somebody who has been disproportionately affected by uh, the war on drugs and has served time for cultivation of cannabis. Um, through that process, we, we learned a lot and really developed a very positive relationship with the Lamoille County Sheriff's Department, um, as well as the state police. I, I personally spent over 60 hours, um, first with the Johnson Select Board, getting a noise permit. Not something that we needed, but something that we wanted to have so the town know, knew that we were going to be actively involved and could ask me questions about our event and what it would and would not be. Um, with these cannabis events, there are a lot of assumptions, and um, most of them we've, we've disproven. Um, and it's through, through diligence um, and through just working harder and, and spending more time. So um, I did not, I, I will reach out to Sheriff Marku because I think that our process really demonstrated that not only can you do a cannabis event legally and safely, we did this on July 1st, the hottest day of the year. Uh, we did this in a place without cell service, without a ton of electricity and infrastructure, and I'm very proud to say that um, we had zero instances of people having to be removed. Nobody lost consciousness even, which I would challenge any other event with a thousand people on a 110 degree day. We jokingly say everybody gained a lot of consciousness, right? Um, but we're, we're seriously very, very proud of that, of that track record, and I think that um, it happened because we worked with Sheriff Mark, who we worked with fire and rescue, we worked with the local hospital and ambulance service, and, um, and went through a lot, of, a lot of work. And so as this committee, and I know this committee spent a lot of time, but as the text of the legislation considers where people can consume, I will suggest that clarifying the definition of a public place, or something that's very much not to my financial interest, creating a cannabis event permit uh, similar to what we do with alcohol. Uh, as the former director of uh, events at, at Burke Mountain, um, plenty of times we got an alcohol permit. You know, you say that you'll have security, you have somebody with a license, you outline where it's going to happen, um, and then you, you fulfill this. The town approves it. Special training for the people working here? Well, it's tied usually to a license of somebody that already has that training. But that's what I mean. There's a requirement to get the special events permit that one way or the other the people serving have training. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's basic, you know, as somebody who's been a certified bartender, um, the training is relatively simple. I've also, you know, been stung by DLC and happy to say pass that successfully. So, you know, ID verification is not rocket science and something that we've got pretty well down. And if you want to get a permit to do an alcohol event, uh, it costs, you know, less than $50 and takes a few minutes. Um, you need a, a local stamp and you need a DLC license that it's tied to. But I would suggest that as we consider um, where people are going to consume this legally and try to regulate the safety of the greater community around them, uh, as well as the people at that event, um, there are ways. And you know, we'd be happy to participate. Um, another example we just had, I mentioned the Growers Cup. Uh, we had an awards party. And at that awards party, uh, this was something that happened in Essex Junction. Once again, we got a call from the Essex authorities. This time there was no outside music and there was no question of uh, whether this was a private or public event. In our mind, in our attorney's minds, we rented it out. We paid them a tidy sum for you know one degree weather in the middle of January for a wedding venue. Pretty good business opportunity for events places. Um, and then through this, and through this process, we same thing. I, ID checks were in place by people who are registered servers. Um, we had a ticketing process that ensured everybody was of legal age. 
And again, I'm very proud to say that at the end of the day, there were zero incidences of public safety in the state police. There were zero that happened locally. There were zero complaints. So I don't think that every, you know, every event planner, I give us a lot of credit and our team and you know, the people around us and the amount of time we spend, but um, we've successfully pulled off these events that have welcomed thousands of people through and since July acknowledged consumption. Now the definition of public consumption versus private consumption uh, is something that we've wrestled with and has come up, you know, kind of a discretion of what our, our, our attorneys have told us and the way we set things up. Um, we go through, like I said, a lot of extra process with having uh, hiring outside security. Um, we get insurance when we do events and getting an insurance rider for a cannabis event is really expensive and a pain, but it can be done. Um, you know, and then making sure the hosts, the neighbors, the local communities, if necessary, uh, are aware and have a chance to, to engage because, you know, people should not have to hide um, and should not have to be treated separately. And in fact, these events that I mentioned have all had economic development. You know, when the Inn at Essex gets an extra 14 rooms because we do our Growers' Cup down the street, or the hotel at Burke, which has had a lot of issues, um, you know, gets an extra 25 rooms on a soft weekend, you know, that's real economic development. I don't even need to make the joke about how well all the restaurants do around us, you know, with the munchies and all that stuff, but that's real too. Um, <laughs> so I want to mention that and also, you know, that is an opportunity. Um, so that's an opportunity of how, how people can consume this legally and we can set pretty strict parameters. But I think with all this, you know, looking at, at alcohol relative, and I know that we've got a long way to go to change the paradigm. Um, and, you know, alcohol in this state is kind of the sacred cow and our economic driver. Um, we heard yesterday our health commissioner say that there was a, an alarming increase in the use of cannabis because it went from 22 to 24 percent. Well, last year in that same period, the use of teenage alcohol went from 30 to 33 percent. So that means alcohol increased 50 percent more than cannabis through that same time period. And yet not only do we celebrate, and me personally, you know, probably too much, um, our Vermont alcohol industry, we actually allocate state funding. We as taxpayers fund the creation of media that tells you where you can buy vodka cheapest in this state and when. So I really think it's important to put things in perspective and to really look at especially economic development opportunities to open this business up and start treating this as a plant um, and as an economic driver in this state and not as a, a, a toxic, dangerous, risky substance. Eli, I appreciate the comments and testimony. And I want to say something just to, you know, it's not just this legislation, it's all kinds of legislation. And when I first got here in the legislature, I thought we were going to do great things quickly. And I slowly learned that we do great things slowly and slowly and much slower than perhaps the public would like and much slower than um, many other people would like. And then on the other hand, much faster. I get, I get emails from people saying, slow down, you're going too fast. I get emails from people saying, you haven't done enough. So if I look back when I started this, um, being involved was in the medical field. That was 2002. Mm -hmm. And Governor Dean was adamantly opposed to medical marijuana. So you look at where medical marijuana is today compared to where it was back in 2002. We started out with great opposition to legalizing marijuana, decriminalizing marijuana. That was what year? Philip, you, you introduced 2011. 2011. Well, no, 2011. It didn't but when you didn't first it. introduced the bill, it was 2011. I so, 2012. So when you start, you start there, and you look to where we are today, with the legal product, and what's happened, and what Matt described all around mm -hmm. us. So, I say that to all of the advocates. I've got dozens of emails, and as I pointed out, some of them ask us to not legalize, mm -hmm. um, but. I've got dozens of emails from people saying, slow down. If you don't take care of traffic safety, you know, you're making a mistake. If you don't take care of prevention, you're making a mistake. And while I may agree with everything you've said, and I agree that we should look at some form of how do we publicly consume, we may not be ready for that this year. 
that may be something that comes in the future. So, uh, you know, and I look back on <coughs> Senator uh, Nitka and I had an experience it's called civil unions back in 2000. And you look where that's come today as where the discussion was back then. And we were the first state to do it. And I look back on that and I say, you know, how backwards we were and some of the views we had. And we, you know, it took, what, what year did we do marriage? 2009. 2009. So it took nine years. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, that just as a caution to everybody here sure. who wants more in this bill than maybe the legislature, and I'm talking now about the House, the Senate, and the governor, are willing to buy. Just given this conversation so, and the conversation right. that we had before around farmers, could we just, um, and I, if somebody suggested it, I'm not sure if it was Michelle or somebody else, could we put in here that the board could consider other types of permits as they go through the rulemaking process that, um, I mean, they clearly have to come back for, to the yeah, like one day permits. event permits or CSA type permits, or, but that they could consider other types of permits well, other plan, than the five we've defined. My plan is to get information from you, your committee on government operations, okay. and maybe other committees, and hopefully spend next, finish testimony on the bill next Wednesday. So. Those of you who may still want to speak on the bill, please sign up by next, for next Wednesday. Yeah. Now on Thursday, go over what are the outstanding issues with Michelle, mm -hmm. um, and what are the things we flagged, and then start to mark it up and hopefully get it out of here the week after next. Okay, now. I, I would agree with uh, Senator White in terms of, in the rulemaking process, asking them to consider something like this, um, the special event permit route, um, I, I see that as potentially a way to mitigate the, the problem we've been talking about of tourists coming into the state. We're, we're facing the industry toward them, um, and we know from other places where it's legalized it has increased tourism. So giving them some route, if, if the hotel they're at has a special event permit, um, where they might be able to consume on the grounds of the hotel where they're staying, I think we can get eventually to a point where you'd have smaller special events. The reason I like that route is it seems to me it goes not perfectly in sync, but more or less hand in hand with secure from sea to sail because there are safeguards all the way through from training for the personnel to the insurance coverage that one, the- One thing we could do is ask for interim, interim, interim recommendations that uh, we could take up. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to take till April 21 before it's actually sold. So you could ask the board to look at interim mm -hmm. recommendations for the report to the legislature mm -hmm. on some of these issues. And I'll say with and I'll say with those and I and I thank you and I appreciate your your point. You know, I'm a I'm a older millennial, um, but you know, we want instant gratification and part of why this state is great well, is that this is a deliberate, <laughs> yeah. <You're welcome. laughs> um, well, we have, you know, and even speaking about longer term and types of licenses, a lodging establishment. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are a, if you're the Highland Inn in Greensboro and your patients want, you know, your guests want to be able to consume safely, hey, guess what? You know, lounges are great, but you still got to get to and from. You know, we let people consume in lodges and lodging establishments. Uh, then they are presumably less likely to be out on the out on the roads. They've already done all their stuff for the day. They're already in the, so that's a longer term, you know, yeah. kind of pie in the sky. I want to I'll, I'll bring it down and conclude with you know this particular legislation on the table today. Um, as I thank you, I think that um, bless you. Um, I think that as we look at other states and look at breaking down this process of how we regulate. Um, effectively and, and tax, you know, cannabis with THC in it, it's helpful to kind of break it down to its, its components uh, and think about what it takes to accomplish these steps and learn our lessons from Massachusetts and other states. So uh, right now, if we have approximately, you know, with our medical program, we're serving about, let's say, 6,000 patients in the state of Vermont presently with a theoretically regulated um, not presently taxed, but at least a formal, you know, sort of overseen process that's defined. 
So about 6,000 patients, if we think about you know, legal consumers, um, if we think about increasing that to 60,000 consumers of THC, which is you know, maybe on the low end of our domestic population consumption, or 600,000 consumers of THC cannabis, which represents you know, some of our population and a tiny percentage of our tourists, we don't have anywhere near the supply. You know, how do we increase our supply by a factor of 100? Um, and that's a very real challenge that we're going to have to think about. You know, I think the commission is an excellent place to start, and I think the composition of that and how long those terms are, um, three-year terms for a two-year election cycle, um, I think that's going to be very important to keep an eye on. So I think that, you know, in 2019, if we can create this commission and we can create a cultivator license, Maybe in 2019, those people sell to the dispensaries. Our medical program, they've you know, acknowledged that they're open to that. You know, they would like to support those small farmers as well. And we do have a pathway in which um, you could be a small cultivator. Now, it's not a perfect economic system when you only have a select number of buyers. But that's something that we could do now. A cultivator license could even be a medical bill if this tax and regulate becomes a, a, a behemoth um, or gets delayed. Uh, but I think that question of, you know, that question of the commission, a testing protocol uh, where it is not overburdensome, we talk about this a lot of in, in terms of hemp, $600 test for every single batch uh, that you have to sell becomes way too expensive for the small farmer we say we want to advantage. Um, so I think that having some sort of testing protocol that does you know, consumer safety is not, I think, the major concern with the public. It is for medical patients if you have immune deficiencies. Um, keeping in mind that this is not objectively a dangerous, toxic substance. And so consumer safety is a concern. Um, but for our Vermont standards, making sure that labels are accurate and that products are, are quality. Um, I think that these are things that we can realistically tackle in, in 2019. And I know from other states that process of licensing and regulating, if there's a 20-page application, if there's a 50, 100-page, somebody's got to read all those applications. And if we want, you know, 100 small farmers to be involved in this, we need to start reading those applications, you know, 2017 um, to be prepared. So uh, I would just, you know, end, end on that and say that I know there's a lot of detail to be worked out and that a lot of it's going to happen in the other chamber. Um, but I think that there's a very positive step here, and uh, especially combining getting medical and getting adult use into the same body is, is really valuable because it is, you know, taxonomically the same the same plan, even if the demo is different. So um, I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions, but appreciate your time. Just a piece of advice. Yes, sir. I had a wonderful lunch there with Chief Justice Rehnquist one day, but I don't think in your presentation you want to use the Highland Lodge as an example of where we have Sure, fair, fair enough. Well, I didn't misquote Ethan Allen this time, at least in front of you. So, you know, generally improving. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Thank you. Uh, can you get uh, Dr. Nathan? Is he from Vermont or somewhere else? Um, I got him from Jersey. Jersey. Oh, so Jersey. Prince, Prince, Prince yeah. Jersey. Yeah. Why do we want to say I should know. Jersey. I'm from Jersey. What part of the Vermont? Oh, oh, are there any Vermont doctors? Are there any Vermont doctors in Massachusetts? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do have a Jersey boy on the committee. That's why they call him. I know. Yeah, the same Jersey same boy. Same we do call him the Jersey boy. The good thing about yeah. him is really? he's a Patriot fan. Right. Better than that. Actually, Peg was there for the same thing. We won't take any nasty comments about New Jersey. <laughs> I know, but you can't find any tomatoes in it. At the tone, please leave a message for us. Dr. David Nathan. Record your message at the tone. When you are finished recording, press pound. To cancel, press star. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nathan. This is Senate Judiciary Committee. We were scheduled to talk with you. I'm sorry you're not available right now. Um, we're going to go to our next witness, and hopefully we can uh, catch up with you shortly. Uh, try Andrew Friedman. I think he's from Colorado. In, uh, Boston, right? Seven, eight, one, I think. I thought he was from Colorado. He used to be a Colorado legislator. He used to be a legislator in Colorado. Regular. 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 Excuse me.
regulator, not legislator. Didn't we hear from him today? Yeah, he hears it. Yes, we've heard from him. Yeah, yeah. He's not a consultant. Many years. When he was with Calvary. Andrew. Andrew, this is Senator Dick Sears. I think you may remember us, the Senate Judiciary yeah. Committee, and we're here talking about um, S-54, a tax and regulate bill, and I understand you're now a consultant um, on these issues. And uh, uh, if you have a few comments to make about S-54, or if you're ready for questions, um, we're, we're ready to listen. Okay, great. I've had some time to review S-54. I've read through the, the bill and also talked to um, the Senate staff that's put together. I think the, the best, I, I, first of all, I, I, I think it's a good, well written, uh, well thought through uh, regulatory system for uh, uh, Vermont. For, for um, uh, on my side, I think where uh, I, I best fit in is now I work for 17 different governments. Uh, from Canada to California, Massachusetts, uh, Maine, uh, and so I think I'm better off taking questions and, and lending my expertise to however you might want it. Okay, a couple of questions. Um, things that have come up during testimony on the bill. Um, one is uh, the issue of social justice in the bill. Uh, are there examples? Um, we did get some information from Massachusetts, but I'm wondering if there's some uh, something in the other 17 states uh, addressing that issue. So, uh, the, um, create, so first of all, uh, people have thought about uh, equity in this area in three different buckets that I've seen so far. One is equity and ownership, uh, one is equity in the workforce, uh, and the third has been equity in the distribution of tax revenue. Uh, I assume here you're talking about the first two. Yeah. Um, uh, um, and there's been no data that's come out on anything yet, so everything is still theoretical systems. Um, uh, that being said, um, um, The California, California devolved it to the cities, and the cities came up with a number of um, varying degrees of complicated schemes for making sure that there is uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, equity. Uh, Oakland, San Francisco um, uh, have come up with one-for-one -one schemes that, uh, uh, that say that for every equity applicant, for every general school applicant, there's an equity applicant that uh, should come through. Um, uh, those have ended up creating quite a few um, uh, potential ownership licenses. Uh, I don't know if I would suggest that uh, to a state. That might be a lot more complicated to, um, to bring in on a state level. Uh, the state of California eventually settled on creating an equity fund um, that uh, provided cities and counties with technical assistance um, and um, uh, ways to access capital for equity applicants uh, that um, the cities and counties could um, tap into if they did have an equity program. Um, that is the only other truly implemented equity um, uh, program out there on a state level. Uh, and I, again, I don't know if I can say that there's any there's any evidence from it that it works or not. In fact, I can tell you that there isn't any evidence that it works or not because everybody's so new. Yeah. Pretty new. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm wondering the other another issue that I would wonder about is um, we're looking at a timeline of having if this all goes well, we would start to open retail sales in April of 2021. Um, are there any examples? Where, we already have a, a regulated medical. Are there any examples where you would allow the medical distributors to start a retail earlier? 
Um, you know, because they're already uh, up and running in several communities. Uh, there would be a concern that if you did that, it creates somewhat of a monopoly, although on the other hand, it allows uh, sales in several communities uh, ahead of time. So are there any examples of yeah. that? Whether people in the audience disagree or agree, it's fine with me, but I was only asking a question. So um, Colorado had 13 months after the passing of the amendment, uh, the constitutional amendment that allowed for adult use uh, to implement an adult use system. So it was 13 months of um, uh, putting up emergency rules, going and getting, uh, kind of implementing statutes from uh, the, uh, the Colorado General Assembly. Uh, and the first, I believe, six months, the might have five months of Colorado's regulated system, um, only, only, the, only the established medical licensees could uh, apply for uh, adult use licenses. Um, and that was a little bit just the, the, um, a worry about volume coming through the, the Department of Revenue um, and uh, a little bit of, uh, well, we know these players, we know they can be up and running uh, and there can be uh, uh, marijuana on the shelves and it was on the shelves starting January 1st, 2014. Um, the, that specific concern, so there's a couple of things there. One, I think it, it was helpful that there's a, a pretty short timeline that the, that medical um, has this kind of leg up uh, on adult use. It wasn't nothing, but it, was, it, was, it wasn't like they were around for two or three years by themselves. Um, and then second, the, the all of the rules were already established by the time that happened. So, um, you know, I think it would have been a worse dynamic if the medical had been allowed to be adult use and they could have come in and started lobbying us to not change the rules um, post um, uh, implementation. Um, and then I would say the, the, the other thing that ended up happening is so much capital came into the game off the sidelines. And these were, this was the early days of there's a lot of people that were just interested in setting up adult use, the first in the world adult use shops. But um, that I would say the, the real complaint ends up being that that the the original people that were in the regulated system ended up getting pushed out by all of this capital coming. Um, and uh, I would say you don't see a lot of the people that were around at the beginning are no longer uh, industry members. Interesting. The third question I had, and then I'll turn it over to other committee members. Um, you've had some testimony about either allowing public use in special events or allowing, I'm going to use the word cafe for lack of a better term, where uh, people can use. And we have the disconnect here where tourists come to Vermont, they might buy the product, but there's no place that they can use it legally. Uh, because they're oh, presumably <coughs> staying in a hotel or whatever that doesn't allow it. Uh, are there other states that have, have public use? Yes, there are other states that have provided um, some statutory language about public use. There, there what have happened uh, is that the locals have been very slow to roll them out. So California has, uh, I think, what they call commercial consumption, um, uh, so ways in which to set up um, current retail stores to be able to allow for uh, use. Um, I, it's, it's, it's not been implemented so much on the local level at this point. Nevada and Las Vegas also have um, some, some places where you, where you can have commercial consumption. This is a really still a pretty open policy question for all of the United States. So it's, it's very much not um, specific to Vermont uh, that you haven't really seen, um, you know, a bar type, club type, uh, legal uh, adult use place to use marijuana or cannabis. Um, I would say uh, that my overall feeling on this is that there will be uh, in, uh, in time and everybody just doesn't want to be the first to do it. Uh, there's certainly a, a compelling reason um, that that the, if you're a tourist state, it is actually a problem that people go back to either the hotel or they don't have anywhere to smoke, and so they end up using edibles and, and 
I think edibles are edibles and tourists are not exactly a good combination. So I do think there's a compelling reason to really think through and see if you might be one of the pioneering people in this. Uh, but it would be you would be the first amongst the first to actually implement such a system. <laughs> Edibles and tourists, not a good <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, thank you. I don't know if other committee members have questions. Just, Senator Nitka. I just, I wonder if you could just speak to the issue um, of some of those states with regard to, do they have a residency requirement for persons who get licenses, or is that an issue in place? Can get one or can't yeah. get one? Sorry, I might have last the question, but if the question is about residency requirement yeah um, to purchase uh, to purchase no no, no to, to, to get the license oh to own yeah yeah so um yes most states do have residency requirements um uh, some say you that 50 percent of the ownership structure um has to be uh, with the resident some say um you know colorado for the first two years was um 100 percent of the residency has to be uh, in uh, Colorado, um, uh, uh, California, I, I believe, I, I, it's escaping me at this time, but I believe that it's um, a much smaller percentage. Um, I will tell you that the real problem from an implementation standpoint um, is whether or not you're going to allow complex corporate structures. Um, because if you allow for complex corporate structures, uh, then kind of doesn't matter what your residency requirements are. There's a lot of ways to um, uh, a lot of ways to get money into the system and, and uh, de facto ownership um, by running it through a couple of corporations. And um, uh, what I would suggest on that is if residency. It, even if residency is not, but if residency is a, a um, uh, an important issue for you guys, that you would only at least initially allow for um, individuals or closely held corporations to invest or to own the owners with, uh, of uh, cannabis licenses. Uh, over time, there'll be a pretty big pushback at, of it, from that as people seek capital. Um, and you probably will have to loosen those regulations um, because this is, I think you will, I think, over time choke the system from capital, but at least initially it's a good way of knowing exactly who owns um, the source. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Um, Senator Nitka. Sure. Um, I think one of the things that comes up, particularly from the administration, um, Yesterday, we had the Commissioner of Public Safety and the Commissioner of Health in. Both criticized the bill because we didn't have a section regarding, I think he wanted roughly $6 million for prevention, and public safety wanted a provision that would allow for um, swabs, oral fluid uh, testing, uh, roadside. Uh, to you know, to determine whether somebody had marijuana in their system, uh, S fifty four has neither uh, initiative in it. Um, can you give us any comments about those issues in other states that you're working with, and how they've either been dealt with or how, if they haven't already implemented, what what's happening with that? So uh, starting with prevention. Um, services, uh, I think the states that have implemented um, uh, prevention services uh, or prevention programs from, um, from cannabis tax revenue uh, have, I think, seen a, a fair bit of success. Um, it's hard to, uh, this is correlation versus causation, but, this, but, but both Washington State and, and Colorado who have um, put the most percentage uh, tax revenue to date into uh, their youth prevention programs also saw some of the most significant drops in youth use during those, those uh, time periods. Now they both came from a really high place, and so they had further to, to drop at that point. Um, uh, but I certainly see it as a right spot, both in Colorado and in Washington State, that um, uh, in some surveys flatlined, in some uh, surveys statistically significant decrease in youth use. Um, and I'm a big fan of proven prevention program. 
difference. I think there's also, um, you know, those should be double-blind studies. Those should be um, uh, uh, rigorously tracked youth prevention programs because there are also a lot of bad youth prevention programs that um, are people's favorites but that have never been proven to work. Um, on the oral fluids, um, uh, there have been a few attempts. I don't know of any on the state level. There have been there have been on the state level um, uh, money for creating drug rec uh, recognition experts, um, particularly through the program called A Ride, yeah. um, and um, there has been uh, money for um, uh, general enforcement. There have been some smaller grant programs for researching new ways of testing, such as oral fluid um, testing. Um, but that, I, I know Colorado put up hundred thousand dollars into it, but didn't really lead anywhere. But that was just not a lot of money. Um, uh, I think there's been a half a million dollar grant somewhere. Um, you know, the 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 problem with all of uh, campus roadside testing is that it doesn't show any creation, uh, and I don't know of any other other than the blood drawn blood drawn test. I don't know of any other test that has gone all the way through the court system. Um, and so my, I imagine, and, and I might be wrong in Vermont law, but I imagine what an oral fluid test would be good for is having something roadside so that then you have probable cause to take somebody to the hospital or the blood uh, drawing station uh, in order to draw their blood. Uh, I think in Vermont, so, if we were to approve something like that, um, the blood test requires a search warrant, so I suspect they're trying to, uh, and I, I of the position that if you wanted to do a oral test, you should also have a search warrant. But, um, we'll see where that goes, but this is, you've been extremely helpful, I think, to the committee. I wonder if there's any other final questions from committee members or from legislative council for Andrew. Just to double check, Andrew, when we first spoke with you, weren't you a resident of Colorado? I was a resident of Colorado, yeah. And um, you've moved to Massachusetts, yeah. I understand? No, I moved to San Francisco. Uh, I've always had uh, the 781 number, though. They got, the, oh. got my phone number when I was at Tufts University. Now, we were hoping you were a Patriots fan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I hate those moves that leave me no points. I'm with the rest of the country on this. Okay. <laughs> Except for Missouri, by the way. Missouri and New England are with the Patriots. Missouri, for some reason. Uh, you had a question, Michelle? Andrew, this is Michelle. I, I just wanted to check in with you. I, I'd like to circle back with you about the residency and the corporate structure, if you don't mind. Just I'll give you a call and we'll try to set something up, if that's all right. Absolutely. And just so you know, this is another one of those unanswered questions. Publicly, allowing for publicly traded companies, allowing for um, uh, different types of corporate structures is a pretty complicated one, but I'm, I'm happy to offline that with you. Thanks. Thanks so yeah. much again, That's Andrew. Helpful. Appreciate it. Be you all up there. Stay warm. Thank you. Yep. Um, just yeah. try the doctor again. Were you Try the doctor again. And I had two doesn't. numbers for him now. Okay. Yeah. 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 I thought you meant now. We spoke to him years ago in Vermont. Yeah. yeah. And we did it in this area. You know, right at the time the Patriots and the Broncos were playing right. each yeah. other's playoff game. Yeah. We got into the conversation of who was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I will note that Missouri is favoring the Patriots. Interesting. Obviously, because the St. Louis Rams went to Los Angeles. <laughs> Please tell me you can hear me. <laughs> I hear you. Yes. Okay, great. I apologize. That's all right. That's all right, uh, Dr. Um, Nathan. Thank you for being with us. Um, I'm Dick Sears, the state senator from Bennington County in Vermont, and chair of this committee. And we have Senator White, Senator Baruth, Senator Nickter, and Senator Benning in a room full of uh, witnesses interested parties and reporters. So please go ahead. You're representing Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. Um, Correct. We're going to hear from doctors against cannabis regulation next week. So um, Absolutely. this is timely. Indeed. Uh, so thank you. And good morning, Senator Sears and members of the Vermont Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, as you said, my name is David Nathan. I'm originally from the Philadelphia area. I attended Princeton University, received my MD from the University of Pennsylvania, and completed my residency in psychiatry.
psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. I'm a board certified psychiatrist and for the past 20 years I've maintained a private practice in Princeton, New Jersey where I live with my wife and our two teenage children. I am a clinical associate professor at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Most relevantly to today, I am the founder and board president of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, or DFCR, and with a prestigious roster of physicians, including former Surgeon General Joyce Lynn Elders and integrative medicine pioneer Andrew Weil, DFCR is the first and only national medical association dedicated to the legalization, taxation, and above all, the effective regulation of cannabis in the United States. Esteemed members, the time has come to regulate the retail sale of cannabis in Vermont. The legalization of personal possession and cultivation of cannabis in 2018 was a major step forward in the move away from the failed prohibition the preceding 80 years. Although it lacked many of the essentials of full legalization and regulation that are necessary to serve the interests of public health and social justice, which are the two main objectives of DFCR. Alcohol prohibition was repealed after just 13 years because of unintended consequences, organized crime, increased use of hard alcohol, and government waste. We have seen the same consequences from the 80-year prohibition of cannabis, organized crime, increased use of stronger cannabis, and government waste. Yet today, the system of cannabis legalization in Vermont is not very different from that of alcohol prohibition. And that is because what we call alcohol prohibition was actually, by today's definition, a, a form of decriminalization in which usual retail sales were forbidden with few exceptions and points of access were restricted even though there, was still, there were still legal forms of possession. Vermont's system does not empower the government to regulate product labeling and purity, which leaves cannabis vulnerable to contamination and adulteration. In Vermont today, any point of access of cannabis, uh, point of sale of cannabis, remain in the hands of criminals who will sell cannabis, potentially along with other dangerous drugs, to underage users. Cannabis cultivation has led to the development of more potent strains, as I mentioned, to the extent that illegal cannabis today is often five times stronger than it was 30 years ago. And when you hear from the opponents of legalization next week, you will hear them uh, emphasize that point. And so I, I, I'd like to address that in anticipation. Vermont's current system prevents regulation of labeling, rendering consumers unable to judge the potency of cannabis which is essentially like drinking alcohol out of a unlabeled bottle that doesn't indicate its strength. That, that is, in the case of alcohol, extremely dangerous. In the case of cannabis, where overdoses aren't lethal, it can be extremely unpleasant and, and lead to panic and trips to the emergency room that really are serving nobody's interest. Thus, the increasing potency of cannabis is to doctors for cannabis regulation a medically sound argument not for prohibition or decriminalization, but for the legalization and the regulation of cannabis so that products are properly labeled with potency, ingredients, and serving information. The underground cannabis economy in Vermont remains <coughs> untaxed, and the drug's illegality serves as a price support mechanism that only profits the illegal producers and dealers. And again, that should remind us all of the 1920s when prohibition fueled the rise of widespread organized crime. That price support mechanism makes the, the, the underground economy more lucrative because the supply is constricted while the demand is, is enabled. Uh, the, the value of that underground economy also makes the uh, industry more dangerous, more violent. So I understand that Governor Scott has indicated that he may oppose S-54 if there's not adequate provision for prevention of assessment of drug driving under the influence of cannabis. Uh, you can stop me now if that's not true, but that's what I was reading in, in the media coming out of uh, Vermont. I think that's true, and uh, it may also be the House of Representatives that wouldn't approve it without that. So. Interesting. Well, so I, I can actually speak very well to that. Um, First, let me just say that we don't know yet whether the legalization of cannabis increases or even decreases
traffic accidents or fatalities, and I can address that potential going either way uh, in Q&A. What we've learned from other states is that while cannabis can impair driving in individuals, especially if they are naive or they consume a very large quantity, the risk of harm is not nearly as great as it is for alcohol. For drugs, including uh, stimulants and sedatives and painkillers and cannabis, uh, across the board, the, the increased risk of accident uh, in general may be something like two to three times the baseline risk of accident. That's actually similar for a hands-free cell phone, believe it or not. Uh, for alcohol, the increase in risk is 12 to 15 times. It's not to say we want people driving under the influence of opioids and sedatives or even stimulants. It is to say that there, we need to keep it in perspective that the kind of impairment we're talking about does not resemble that of alcohol. Now, government Scott's objections are, to me, puzzling. As cannabis use was widespread prior to and following Vermont's legalization, and there's no reason to think that the implementation of retail sales of cannabis would necessarily change any risk of DUI cannabis, especially if greater regulation was accompanied by better public education about responsible use. You know, you can only really have a serious conversation with adults, and especially with minors, when the law reflects the actual risks of harm. Uh, and so if the law reflects the fact that we don't want people driving under the influence, uh, but private use of cannabis is okay, that sends a, a better message than saying, well, it's, it's bad for everybody under all circumstances, and therefore, you know, we're not going to allow it. Greater regulation breeds greater respect for the science, and I believe for the law. So to me, the best approach to DUI cannabis is the use of drug recognition experts, and we have a lot of experience about that here in New Jersey, where we have the second largest number of drug recognition experts in the country, second only to California, a much bigger state. And here in New Jersey, the, uh, the, the drug regulation, sorry, the drug recognition experts organization uh, is very robust. They have 400, I believe, 500 trained drug recognition experts. It's a less than one week training period and uh, you can have officers all over the state who are better trained to identify impaired driving of any kind, not just with cannabis, but also with, like I say, opioids and We've, and we've had actually had quite alcohol. a bit, of, we've actually had quite a bit of testimony on the DREs and their value and um, Great. I believe Vermont has 55 currently. One of the problems right now is geographic distribution of the DREs and some areas have more than others, and so that's created some issues. But sure. I, if you ever want me to connect <coughs> you to uh, Lieutenant Chris Dudzik, who is here in New Jersey and really on the ball, uh, he's the head of the he's the president of the NJDREs. Um, I, I would be happy to make that connection that, that and would talk be great. about how it is they're trying to get officers from all departments. Because really, you need people everywhere. Right. Uh, you can't have some people getting the usual. Uh, relatively crude field testing in one place and you know other places have better circumstances and of course for I, I don't think that Vermont is considering a per se uh, no. offense with a blood level no. um, but it, I, it I would, be, they should it would not. be an oral fluid roadside not. test you just said we should really not right I know that was oh. what well that's what the proposal from uh, the Public Safety Commissioner is yeah well it's not reliable that's the problem, and I don't know that we're going to get a test. I, trust me, it would make my life a lot easier in my organization if we had something like we, a breathalyzer for alcohol, but that doesn't exist. You, you know, you will come up with a positive uh, test in people who have not used recently and are not impaired at all, you, and you will come up with people who are negative even if they have very recently consumed. If, if so, you could uh, give Peggy uh, Delaney, who you've been working with, the name of that lieutenant, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. I will make a note of that. Um, and uh, so I'll just round out by saying I'm, I thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to answer your questions and address any of these issues or any others you may have. If thank you, you have a, uh, if, if your organization or you have prepared remarks, if you could also send them, that would be helpful because I thought that your comments regarding um, Prohibition were especially helpful. Mm -hmm. um, 
you were right to the point, and uh, frankly, uh, that's helpful to hear. Um, Great. I will send along exactly what I said, and if there's particular topics you want greater detail on, no, um, I, I think we have a wealth of resources I, here. I appreciate that, but I thought your comments regarding prohibition were particularly helpful. Uh, yeah, Senator I'll tell you, you know, I've been talking about this for a while, and I'm finally catching up on Boardwalk Empire, which living in New Jersey is actually <laughs> quite fun, because you see all these places mentioned. My dad grew up, actually, in Atlantic City and knew who Nucky Johnson was back in the day. Um, well, I had and not it really there. It was quite the Wild West back then. I remember that. Yeah. I remember hearing about Nucky Johnson. Yep, yep. Uh, Senator White has a question. So my question is, um, are there any physicians in Vermont brave enough to belong to this group? Because the uh, Vermont Medical Society has come out opposed to it. As we have the same issue with law enforcement. We have only a couple law enforcement people who are brave enough to actually support this. Is, are, is there anybody in Vermont that belongs to your organization? As I recall, there are. Um, you know, the small size of Vermont may be an effect, but for the most part, we have physicians in I think 45 of the states, mm -hmm. and I don't think Vermont is one that we're lacking. Um, while we're talking, actually, I'm going to our membership list, and you know, I can say this, that you know, we've got people, I know we have spokespeople in, in New Hampshire um, who are actually going to be testifying, I believe, next week, uh, and you know, neighboring New York, upstate New York, we have people. Um, so if we don't have somebody in Vermont, we certainly have them nearby. And I'm sure we have members, but not all members uh, who are willing to have their names out no, there no, and feel no. comfortable with actually giving testimony. No, I, um, I understand that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so let's see. According to our list here, yes, we have several members in Vermont. Uh, I, well, one of them went to my medical school. I can um, certainly contact all of them. Uh, and see if any of them are willing to uh, uh, to speak out. I mean, that's the thing about the FCR has been that we've made it safe for doctors to speak up yeah. because they've got the backing of, of respected academic physicians all around the country. Uh, so it's no longer that political third rail it used to be for physicians. It still would that. be in Vermont probably, so we don't need to, I just wondered. We don't need to. Oh, we have them, yeah. yeah. We have those. Okay. Uh, it's good to know that there are some Vermont Positions of yeah, I'm seeing here Arlington, Richmond, Burlington. Arlington are the three is I'm looking at right now. Yeah. Burlington is Senator Bruce district. Mm -hmm. There are so few physicians in Arlington, I could probably identify the person without. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very small community. So. Anyway, yeah. uh, Dr. Nathan, thank you so much for your testimony. Very helpful. Uh, it is my pleasure. Please don't hesitate to let me know if there's more information I can provide. And back on the DUI issue, yep. if you guys haven't connected with Paul Armentano, who I regard as being the nation's biggest expert on this question, uh, that could be a really good idea because of uh, the importance it seems to have uh, in Vermont. That, so if I we could connect get him next well. Wednesday, that would be helpful. Maybe David knows who he is, too. So that would be helpful. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, my pleasure. I'll be following up, and uh, let me know if you have any other questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Since you. I know the Attorney General and I don't see the Attorney General here. Huh? Is he out there? No. Um, Gwen, do you want to jump in to the fire? So to speak. Would you send a message to either the Attorney yeah, General? Yeah, running from somewhere at 11, so okay. we Well, it's 20 past 11 now. <coughs> Hopefully he's not running too far. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, well, Gwen Zaka. <laughs> Gwen Zaka, Vermont Lincoln Cities and Towns. Um, so I'll dive just right into the bill uh, because I feel like everybody else is talking about the things that we have interest in, but I'm just going to get down to the nitty gritty and identify some of the things that um, might need a little bit more focus or things that we really like. Um, and I'll start off sort of by saying that um, this has been a long discussion going on for many, many years. And the longer you um, learn about the rollouts of these sorts of uh, tax-regulated marketplaces in other states, 
the more questions you have and the more I reach out to other municipalities and the states that have gone through this process, um, you, learn, you learn a lot of what to watch out for and um, what issues to identify early on in order to prevent those issues from happening um, to a place like Vermont. Um, so I think the first issue I want to touch upon is the, the timing of all of this rollout. Um, I think that everyone's familiar at the table how Vermont is this sort of Dillon's rule state where municipalities can't really do anything until they get direct authority from the state and we would be the first state to legalize um, and have municipalities in that position. Every state that has legalized so far has municipalities that are home rule states so they have this sort of flexibility to anticipate things and prep for things and, and zone for things and regulate things um, even before they're given authority to do it unless they're prevented from doing it. Um, our municipalities just don't have that flexibility right now. So the importance of how this gets, how the rollout is timed um, is critical. <laughs> um, it's not just about the timing of adopting ordinances and having the public hearings or amending zoning bylaws. That's, I see that as kind of further down the road. I see the first big timing issue as being the time you need to really talk to your communities, your community members, whether it's teachers, students, business owners, um, residences, I mean, it, it, the zoning administrator, anyone, anyone in the community that wants to really understand what the subject matter is and understand the implications, um, that, takes, that takes time. And again, going back to the Dillon's rule issue is that until there's rules that are in play at the state level, it's really hard to anticipate how you're gonna zone for something if you don't know exactly what you're waiting for. It's really hard to say, oh, I'm gonna adopt an ordinance and put these time, place, manner regulations into something when you really don't know how the, what the rules are gonna look like. Um, so that being the backdrop, <laughs> um, zoning and the implementation in, or sorry, not just the zoning, but the ordinance implementation that is already on um, on page 16 of the uh, of the bill. Um, the on at the very end of the implementation date, it says July 1st, 2019, that it goes into play. Um, that's a really short window of time for a rollout, and um, I would hope that the committee would think a little bit more about how this logistically would roll out and what would happen July 1st, 2019 in terms of um, voting to opt in or opt out or amending um, regulations, uh, updating um, ordinances that might be in place, thinking about new ordinances that you want to put into place. Um, so there's that. Could you, could you go back sure. and say where it is, what rolls out on 2019? Oh, sorry, sorry, was I Page 16, sorry. Uh, no, I'm on page 16. Yeah. And so the, it, at the very back of the bill, when they talk about the implementation dates, this uh -huh. section 8, 9, I can't remember what section, section 8. It's, it's the regulation by local government? Is that the same? Yeah, it's, it's put in as a rollout of, I think, July 1st, 2019. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Michelle, that, you want to comment? Yeah. So yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's very um, rolling effective dates for the session. So, that section takes effect um, early on, but the way that the permitting and every, it, it has to in order for the rulemaking for the board to get going, all of that other kind of stuff. There's no actual applications for licensing right. until there are rules adopted, all that stuff. So there's at least one, potentially two, right. town meeting days right. where there can be votes for opt out prior right. to any retail facility <coughs> selling. Right. And so, right. Um, that takes effect, but it doesn't. But you, you still, you don't. But there's still like right. a two-year, almost like a two-year right. rollout. Right. Yeah, and and if if the statutory language were to ex to really highlight what those establishment establishments looked like, so they could start doing the work of zoning, and saying, okay, now we know what we're zoning for. Even if the licensing and whatnot and the rules were coming later on, you really can't zone until you know what the rules are going to say about what you're anticipating. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's hard to plan for something you don't know what it's going to look like. I don't understand yeah. because there are five, already in here, there are five kinds of establishments. It, maybe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So, in other words, we're saying cultivators' licenses, but we haven't nailed down exactly how big or what the limits on 
the space will be. So that's going to come about with rulemaking. And I think what, what we're hearing is that, that that leaves their decision to zone until they know exactly what it is, which will be much less than the two town meeting day cycle. Um, so. I, yeah, because we've heard so many different things about what, what to expect. It's going to be rural operations, downtown operations. It's going to be this side, it's going to be that side. So until you kind of understand how to, and like right now, if you look at zoning bylaws, they might define industrial pretty broadly, or they might decide, define retail really broadly. If someone handed me, if I was a zoning administrator, and handed me in preparation for getting a license, a permit to get a retail operation, and there was no legal reason for me to deny it, even if it was a marijuana you know, establishment, I have to approve it, and it doesn't really give the community the time ahead of time to sort of think about if they want to amend what the definition of retail is or what the definition of. I believe that the Government Operations Committee will look at that. Sure. On Tuesday, we're going to sure. Okay. If I don't, if you wouldn't mind, sure. if we could go to the Attorney General sure. on a tight schedule. And we'll call you back if that's okay. But I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Please. I'm always here, so. Yeah. Well, he's, he's on a tight schedule. Yes, we appreciate him coming over and meeting with us. So. Well, I appreciate it, Senator. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Donovan. Thank you. Uh, TJ Donovan, Attorney General. Um, I support uh, S54. It's time to have a regulated system uh, for the sale of cannabis in this state. Uh, my position has evolved on this. I supported uh, the legalization of possession. I thought that was the right thing to do. But we've seen that we can't tell Vermonters that they can possess marijuana and be silent on how you obtain it uh, because the black market exists and capitalism is only going to grow in this area. Uh, we dealt with this issue this past summer when uh, the issues of gifting uh, came up and why we need regulations is for that very reason, for consumer protection. Uh, we saw that, I think, in Burlington uh, earlier this week. So I want to thank the committee uh, for their work on this bill. Um, some of the aspects of the bill that are most important to me are, uh, number one, providing access to products which have been tested that are child-resistant packaging and that are labeled for potency. Second, providing bans on advertising that make false claims, appeal to children, or encourage overconsumption. Uh, third, providing rules that regulate edible products and ensure that cannabis isn't combined with alcohol or tobacco. Uh, fourth, uh, providing educational materials and information about safe consumption to help reduce the potential for harmful impacts of cannabis use. From a law enforcement perspective, I think S54 provides some important components. I think requiring the seed to sale tracking to prevent diversion of products to children is incredibly important. Uh, providing criminal background checks for employees and license holders to prevent criminal elements from getting involved in these businesses. Uh, make a clear ban on the gifting loophole that my office addressed earlier this summer. Um, and, I, and I just want to note on that, we, and I know Eli Harrington is, is here, um, Tim Fair, um, you know, we talked to these guys in the summer, and most of the folks, I think, shut down uh, the operations after we put out uh, the guidance. But as I think I said to a, a news organization, I'm not naive enough to think that the market completely stopped, and it didn't, and again, reinforces to me the need uh, for consumer protection regulations. Um, I think educating license holders on enforcement and security procedures to prevent diversion is important and implementing rules related to the health and safety at cannabis uh, businesses. And I think S54 makes a really strong attempt of creating a Vermont style regulatory system. And uh, I think this committee should be commended for its work. We look forward to uh, working with you, uh, but I don't think we can, can we, we have to have a regulated market. Um, I just, I, I don't think we continue uh, to go and be silent on the issue about how Vermonters obtain it. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, this is about protecting consumers and protecting kids, and we need, we need regulations. So um, I support the bill, and I look forward to working with you. I really appreciate that. It's extremely helpful, uh, especially from the top law enforcement officer of the state. Um, we were just talking about 
law enforcement officers brave enough to support the effort, and here you are. Um, so thank you for that. Well, thank you, thank you. I, I you know, for me, um, I think the evolution is clear, and you know, from decriminalization to, to legalizing uh, possession, this is the next logical step. And um, regulations are about consumer protection, and that's that's our job. At and the full end of the disclosure, day. when we invited you here, I had no idea what you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the comments. Okay. Well, I was prepared. I'm always prepared for the worst, but yeah. for the best. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, uh, more times than not, we're on the same page, and I think this is this is common sense, and this yeah, is where I, we are. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the current prohibition yep. aspect and the difficulty for your office and state's attorneys around the state to kind of deal with these things. And I, I heard the comments of the chief of the Burlington Police Department about priority being heroin, fentanyl, and other drugs, yep. and I know that is for your office as well and marijuana slides down, and then you have this operation where openly selling even to minors, according yeah. to the articles in the press. So, can you comment a little bit on the prohibition aspect? Yeah, it, it, it's, in, it's incredibly hard because I think, look, the, the, the priority is, as you said, going to be opiates and, and heroin. Um, and I do think that there has been, um, and I think Chief Del Pozo said this, you know, the message that we're we're on the road to f a fully regulated and legalized system. And that's kind of set, uh, I, I think, the, the tone in this state a little bit that perhaps we're not going to, going to enforce it. And I think we dealt with this issue this summer on the gifting. And again, you know, Eli's in the room where we said, hey, listen, somebody's going to get hurt on this. Some kid may get hurt. Um, and this is why we need regulations. And so you, you try to hope that people are going to do the right thing, but I think what we saw, particularly in Burlington, when, we, when we're silent, you're going to have an abuse <coughs> of that system, and thankfully uh, somebody didn't get hurt, but it raises real issues, and I, for me it reinforces the need uh, to have regulations um, and, to, and to pass this bill because it makes sense and it's the right thing to do, and I think Vermonters expect it. I, I, I don't think... Um, we can say any longer to, to folks, you can use it, um, but we're not going to tell you how to, how to get it. Yeah, I, uh, living on the border of Massachusetts, where uh, retail sales were already taking place, yep. no question that constituents of mine are headed down there to buy it uh, legally and then bring it back to Vermont that's it, and pay the tax in Massachusetts tax in Great Barrington, and good for them, they're getting the money, and Vermont's getting the problem. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I think this is a, is a common sense approach, and uh, thank you for your leadership on it. Thank you. Um, other questions for the Attorney General? I'll brief them to the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, DJ. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. I know you're on a busy schedule. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming in my schedule. So I am curious about when you talked about um, allowing the criminal element to, yep. to um, own you or be part of it. Yep. So where do you draw the line on who the criminal element is? I mean, clearly we don't want the yep. cartels or anybody to be involved, but we have a lot of people who have been I mean, in the state who've been convicted of some of them uh, felonies, um, nonviolent felonies. Yep. Do you would you draw the line at anybody who has a record, or from being part of the ownership? No, I, okay. I, I. Where would you draw the line? I'm not sure I'm understanding your your question completely, but what I would say is this: I support expunging old marijuana convictions. I think the system is, has been in, incredibly. Uh, disparate in its treatment towards people. Um, so in terms of who could possess a license, yeah. who had a prior marijuana conviction? Or any other drug conviction or conviction? I mean, I think I would draw the line on people who trafficked heroin um, and cocaine and, and drugs that kill people. Okay. I think it's important to say, you raise an important point to me, that, and, and that's helpful. 
Um, you know, I'm not naive enough to not believe that some of the, her the, the marijuana that comes to Vermont is fairly innocent, uh, grown by Vermonters, mm -hmm. uh, shared with their friends and associates. But there's also some of the marijuana that comes to Vermont is coming through a criminal enterprise yeah. that is not part of this country, mm -hmm. and, or this, certainly not part of the state, may not even be part of this country. And I think there's an important distinction there, because that group, um, you know, when you see eight to 50 pounds, it's a little different than um, what we're yeah, I, I just wondered about it because I know we just um, in GovOps were looking at the notary, yeah. just something as simple as notary, and it says in there that if you you can be denied a permit if you have any felony connection, yep. conviction, which seems to me a little bit outrageous. But so well, I just wondered. I, I mean, as Senator Shears knows, I mean we've been, this committee and the Senate as a whole I mean, has done a lot of good work in terms of expunging old mm, yeah. criminal records because of the collateral consequences that attach that make people ineligible. What I would say, particularly on the issue of marijuana convictions, I would say overall, um, I think that we'd, we'd have to look back and say most people probably are deserving of that expungement and if they so choose, wanted to obtain a license, let them go through the normal process. That being said, I think the facts do matter, and I think you have to look at each case and each individual uh, separately because each case is different. Um, but I think the fact of the matter is that the criminal justice system historically probably overcommitted people. That that's changed, but for many folks, uh, they're dealing with old convictions that have kept them sidelined. But I'm each each case is different. Is what I would say. I'm talking to conviction possession of this. Hard time finding a record to expunge it. TJ, in that regard, we had an earlier witness today who was talking about the racial imbalance yep. of past convictions, yep. and he, he raised the question of should people of color actually not just be considered in the mix for licensure, but step to the front of the line? I hadn't thought about that until he mentioned it, but and you may not have an answer on this right now, but just to plug it in your ear right now. Um, is there any potential for uh, us running afoul of equal protection language? Um, I'm just curious to know if your office can somehow look into that. We, we're happy to. Um, I, I think, again, when you look, Senator, you know this as well, um, historically at the criminal justice system, the disparate treatment of who's been convicted overwhelmingly has been people of color and people who are poor. And if there's a way to do it, that would pass uh, constitutional muster uh, to uh, perhaps, as you said, uh, allow people uh, a greater incentive. I think that's something that should be considered. And we're happy to, we're happy to work collaboratively with you on that. The bill currently allows for consideration. The question is whether or not they would jump from consideration up to the front of the line is where I'm beginning to question my own mind. Is that constitutional? We're, we're happy to work with you on it. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you. When the, uh, thank you for relinquishing the chair for a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. You were, I think we finished part of the issue of the rollout. Could, could I ask a question, Mr. Chair? I'm, I'm wondering, you were pointing to what you saw as potential problems in the timeline for municipalities. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any rough suggestion of how that might be handled. Have, have you thought about um, creating a timeline that worked for you? Um, it's That's a hard question to answer because, you know, um, going back to the whole um, issue of the different types of regulations in place, um, it takes time whether you're amending a small part of your zoning bylaws or a larger part of your zoning bylaws. Um, I just mean general, generally speaking, you've looked at the timeline, right. you were critiquing the bill's timeline. Right, right, right. I'm wondering right, right. in the interest of making it work more smoothly for your community if you had suggestions on how we right. could alter the timeline. Um, that's a tough one until you have the sort of rules in place to understand how you're going to prepare for something. 
I don't have a good answer for that. I just think, I think obviously the first, the easiest way to go about it in the whole opt-in, opt-out, you know, whether the community wants in or out, um, that's probably the easy, not, it's not, certainly not the easiest question to go through, but it's, it's a yes or no answer, right? So it's not like you're going, you know, going through your regulations with a fine tooth comb. Um, so that, that's the first thing you'd want to get checked off before you even think about how you're going to deal with um, ordinances and bylaws. So um, that kind of loops back into my, my next comment, which was the, the opt-in versus opt-out model. And, and, and VLCT, VLCT feels really strongly that the, the opt-in model would be the ideal model. Um, and the reason for that is because that's what we've heard from other <laughs> states and other communities that have gone through it. Because what tends to happen, and I, I would say and guess that the knee-jerk reaction from many communities, and it is a protectionist mode when they don't know what's coming down, they don't know what they're going to get things done in a timely manner to change the regulations that they need to anticipate what's coming down, is to say no. And um, that knee-jerk reaction doesn't really create good results. It um, is generally based off of fear. It's not based off of any real good education or understanding of what they're dealing with. And I think that you know, I would argue that that doesn't provide a lot of certainty to the industry in, in, in knowing, you know, where they stand with the community or whether they're, they're welcome or not. Um, maybe there's a way to time it where, you know, by a certain date, you have to opt in. And if, if, if you don't buy that certain date, you'll just be presumed to have allowed it. So at least they're given some flexibility of saying, okay, Oh my God! I don't feel rushed. My my initial reaction is to just say no until we're ready, and we've got everything squared away, and then we'll get back to the to the drawing board and decide differently. That was that's what I've heard from other communities in other states. Is that that's there's going to be communities that are all for it, and that's great, and they're going to go, <laughs> and there's the ones that are going to be totally against it. But there's going to be a lot of communities. That it's going to be a really tough decision, a really tough dialogue in a community, and just to protect themselves. They're, they're going to say no because it's the only method that's the only control mechanism they would have in place in order to feel like they, they have um, some semblance of control over the matter what do we do with alcohol is that an opt-in or opt-out that's an opt-out i believe mm -hmm. now it is it initially from what i understand um there was a time period where you had to make a, a back in after prohibition there was a uh, time period where they had to affirmatively say one way or the other. I don't, I'd have to look and see what the records say about that, but. Be interesting to find out what. And Maine is the only other state right now that has. I'm sorry, what? Maine is the only other state right now that has that opt-in model. Every other state has the opt-out. And they had less problems rolling it out in Massachusetts. Right. Partly because of that. And I know Clarksburg, Mass, which is right on the border with Stanford, Vermont, had a lot of discussion about a cult of cultivation, you know, a farm. Right, right. In their borders, whether right. they wanted it or didn't want it. If I could um, just say, uh, I was out in Southern California for a while. They had an opt-in model. And so I was in the southernmost part of the state. What that's produced is San Diego opted for recreational, all the beach communities up, up for another hour opted out or, or never opted in. Right. And so what that's done is to sort of supercharge the delivery business because you have people running yeah. up with product. So the, the legislation um, legalized transporting right. product from one, so you can't ban something coming in via delivery right. systems. I think we're not so hot on the delivery process. So an opt out seems like a way of um, making sure we don't by default create these delivery businesses that will step in to fill the big geographical gaps right. between communities right. that opt in. I mean, no, I, I, un I understand why the opt out, is, why people think that it's a good idea, but I also see the flip side of it and sort of the realities of the, particularly in a place like Vermont where you don't have that, you can't, you can't preempt anything or you're always waiting for direction well, and the knee-jerk reaction for some will just say no until we, we feel like we have enough information to make a, a different decision. One day we were talking about more work camps. 
and the town of Bennington immediately banned them. So, you know, yeah. had a vote. No, we don't support work camp. Nobody ever talked about putting one there, but because right. I said it, they decided they didn't want it. Um, so not part, because they didn't like me, but just right. because they don't want right. a work camp. So part of the issue, the decision about opt-in, opt-out, is related to the timing and not knowing what they might be zoning for or against or what ordinance. That's a huge, that's a huge part of it. So yes. we, we should look at, um, all right. I'm, yeah. Okay. You, you yeah, know, and you, you, yeah. I mean, this is more your bailiwick. We'll, we'll, um, we're going to spend a lot of time on Tuesday and Wednesday on this. Um, okay. Okay, so I'll <laughs> skip over. Okay, sorry. I just, I just have a question, too. So. So apparently you believe that a town can ban a business. In, in other words, if you can say we don't want a marijuana shop, a mm -hmm. shop in our town at all, mm -hmm. are you comfortable? Can you say that that's okay to do it to ban that kind of business? Currently? Yes. yes. Well, we don't, there is no, well, you couldn't because they're not allowed under state well, law, but. Okay, okay that's oh. correct. But um, I'm thinking of Ludlow, which years okay. ago um, was told I think it was it happened because of a court case, I believe, that they could not forbid an adult bookstore from coming right. into town. Right. Okay, so that's right. So what they did then was okay, we'll have them, we'll say they can, we'll zone them into the industrial park. Right. It's parking, right. yep. whatever, they can do what they want. Yep. And so, does is this at all related to that? Because subsequent to that, in Ludlow, when there was a vape shop directly across from the town hall, um, they then passed something, an ordinance, I would guess, that. Yeah. Um, couldn't have that, and then Michelle tells me they also said that you, you couldn't have like, marijuana, you couldn't have anything. Right. You, you know, the, the vape shop was able to continue right. because it was after that, but they have that ordinance now that says you can't do marijuana either. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, how does all that work? And I think some communities still have that after the medical marijuana um, right. laws came through as well. So, you're going to see a very, and if they do address marijuana, it, it's also how they define it as well. well. So um, how does that work in terms well, of... Well, Powell had a unique si system of banning the adult bookshop. They burned it down. <laughs> oh, well, that's one way to do it. You don't want to burn down a marijuana I shouldn't say they did, because we never knew out. who burned it down. Yeah. So just, how does that all fall together? Well, we, we just passed a natural resources <laughs> bill that says every town must have renewable <laughs> energy. It enabled each town to say where would that be in the confines of that district. Right. And generally, the zoning bylaws don't discriminate. Like the those bookshops, that there's there's constitutional law and, and case law that talks about those that sort of speech, um, right, that regulated speech. But um, generally, you know, the, the, I use that retail. Like if someone were to give me a, a zoning application, mm -hmm. I'm not discriminating on what they're doing. I'm just looking at the criteria of what business they're running and how it sort of manifests itself in the community, whether it's parking or noises or right. you know hours of operation, those sorts of things. Um, so, but I think that the, the because marijuana and, and, and alcohol and those sorts of things are um, uh, seen in a different light than um, a bookstore, they're zoned a little bit differently. Um, and they might, be, I mean, even in, in, in law right now in statute, you have, you know, uh, setbacks for distances from schools or distances from state buildings. I mean, there's, it's not even anticipated in this right now. So they can go anywhere technically if you want them to, if they're not, if it doesn't say otherwise. It, I, I take your point about discussions occurring, hard discussions occurring at a natural pace in communities, and then they're going to run up against the, the idea that they need to um, opt out and get the votes for that. Right. But it seems to me that communities that are conflicted about it could immediately pass moratoriums on it for a certain period of time while it's considered. So they would have that ability. So no one's going to be forcing them to allow it in advance of their discussions and warned votes. Right. Um, the way the it's written right now, yeah. the it just it doesn't say anything about a moratorium. It just well, says up but, or down. But suppose they opt out. Right. Have the discussion and right. then two years later opt in. Right. I, I mean. Oh no! Ab yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But that doesn't create a lot of certainty for applicants that might be. No, understood. Right, right. But, I, but I'm just saying, if we're if we're balancing the needs of municipal 
um, governments right. to function, it seems like there there are reasonable mechanisms already in place that allow them to slow the discussion down. Certainly, and certainly. Have it at the right pace. Yeah, and there's automatically, and I don't know, I know <coughs> nothing about other state laws that have this, but right now under Title 17, if you have a vote on something and you don't like the way it goes, you have a 30-day appeal period for a revote. Mm -hmm. So um, they can petition for a revote. It's 5% right now of, um, of the voters, although that can be changed. That's another detail. Um, and that the second vote, however it goes, is in place for 12 months. So you can't even have a revote for 12 months. So there's an automatic, you know, depending on who shows up to the polls and how it's, it's you're stuck with that until, until 12 months. So. But you could do it in a way that it was a different question. Yeah. So, sure. Um, and and we're going to ban. Um, we we want to have an ordinance on hours of retail. Right. I mean, you could right. you could word it sure. so that it was a different vote, yeah. so that it wasn't a revote of the same sure vote. Thing. Yeah. 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 I'd like to ask this out of ignorance: Is it possible to have a vote to opt out for a given period of time? It's not clear. It's not, it just says so vote. So wanted to opt so, out today and come back in 2022. Um, but to have that Maybe. Again. It just says a town of votes. <laughs> There's not a lot of great detail. So that kind of, that, that leads me into the, the next thing I wanted to touch upon, which was this cannabis control commission sort of makeup. Um, the reason VLCT was really in love with the idea of using liquor, the liquor control model is because it's already there and it's tested and it, for the most part, not perfect, it works because city councils, select boards, they're, they're used to the system. And um, the way I see it, it's a, it's a closed circle system. And um, the, the liquor control board and the rules that they promulgate um, have strong consideration for municipalities and it loops fully back to, um, to the local community. And under what's proposed, at least right now, it, there's only one sentence saying that a, a, a town can have a liquor, or sorry, a cannabis control commission. Mm -hmm. oh, there's two sentences, um, and that's it. I would warn that that's a probably not the best approach to do this, um, because if you were to give that sort of leverage and control to any community, you're basically saying, do whatever you want. And we're normally all about local control, but under these sorts of things, real tie-in to the state models and state regulations is really important and it works really well under the look control model so um, if you go to title seven um, you'll see pages upon pages about the duties of the local control commissioners um, you'll see you know language about how the um, the rules that are administered and furnished by the board of liquor and lottery um, apply to the municipalities it's a it's a closed loop system it's all tied in um, and i think it, that is the, the model to go after and um, it creates ease of administration, it creates certainty, and it creates a, um, a line between state regulations and local regulations where they marry pretty well. And um, that in and of itself would create a lot of um, ease for everyone. So you're saying to kind of follow the model as it relates to municipalities, but not necessarily to have the board be the liquor and lottery board. No, oh, no. We, we, I just want yeah, to be yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we were just saying, well, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. It works. Not perfect, but it works. Um, and it's just one less thing um, that a select board or a city council would have to worry about one less permit. But if it's not, even if it's something separate, if you can, if the legislature could model it as closely um, to how to, to okay. close that circle, gotcha. it would make everything much easier. Great. Other and just one one last thing. Um, the going back to that issue of the closed link. If um, I don't know how things are going to wind up with the liquor control or the cannabis control board, um, similar to what happened with the medical marijuana, having a local, it, could, it doesn't have to be VLCT. It could be a, a planner. It could be anybody, but someone who really understands when you're promulgating rules that are going to have impacts about how things are situated in a downtown or whatever, it would be really helpful to have someone who understands that, not just from a law enforcement perspective or a ACCD perspective, but someone who really understands like 
what do, how, how do ordinances work? What about noise, noise ordinances? What about zoning? What about you know, processes of voting? I mean, if, just to have a local voice, and that would be really, really helpful. It's worked with the Marijuana Symptom Relief Commission. Um, it's, it works with liquor and lottery. It's, it, it, you, just, you need that voice, because otherwise they don't, they're kind of grasping at straws trying to fill the, the gaps. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. By the way, we have a strong pollinator bill coming out of the house. Oh, good. Yay. We'll get it done this year. Yay. All right.